All right, all right. Thank you for joining me in this episode of the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marta Wilson, and we have another fantastic show, debate, open discussion for you, whatever you want to call it. Today, we're going to have fun discussion. We are going to be talking about Calvinism, the tulip acoustic of Calvinism, and we are going to have a fantastic discussion. I have Jeffrey Rice, I have Braden Patterson, I have JP, and I have Mr. Mahler with me, and we are going to have a fantastic, fun discussion. But before I bring the fellas in, I do want to make sure you know to subscribe to The Gospel Truth and hit that notification bell because you don't want to miss out on any shows that are coming up here in the future on the gospel truth any debates interviews or commentaries so make sure you subscribe and do that fast all right as always all these all this content is not only on youtube but it's also on facebook facebook uh twitter or x and instagram and tiktok so make sure you flow over there to subscribe to the gospel truth on those platforms so don't miss out on anything we have going on on all those platforms also uh if you're not aware uh this content is on podcast as well itunes google play and stitcher so make sure you flow over there to hit the subscribe on those podcast platforms as well and as always i do have some shows that are coming up here in the future that i want you guys to be aware of all right uh coming up after this debate i do have up uh, not that one that one's today so this one is coming up here next uh we got dr michael burgles and john uh david barton that's going to be jumping on here the son existed with the father so i hope you guys are looking forward to this one and it's going to be a fun debate trinitarian versus oneness and we are going to have a fun filled debate with that one after that father jonathan avanov versus brandon nero is jesus the father trinitarian versus oneness once again uh this is going to be a fun debate as well so hopefully we will have fun with that one and hopefully you are looking forward to that one as well and we have a we have a trinitarian and unitarian debate jesus is god in the new testament that is going to be the top topic of that debate dr sean cole andrew griffin's going to be jumping into the ring and we're going to have a fun debate in that with that premise there all right after um and uh, as always uh we are doing a media fund media equipment fundraiser we are going to be raising funds so we can uh support ourselves when it comes to media equipment we don't have to rely on a venue or anything like that no matter if we're outside or inside at a hotel wherever it is we have uh we have the media the, the we will have media equipment to support ourselves so if god is pulling your heart to support the ministry with a gift please do that you can look at look for the link in the description of this video and that will take you to the fundraiser page so we can support the ministry with this desire all right that said uh we are excited for this one uh this one was just planned maybe about mm, maybe about two weeks ago um and so we are going to have fun uh so uh i saw the conversation going on on facebook and if anyone followed me on facebook <laughs> i i look at facebook comments and i will look at discussions and things like that and I will see if people are intrigued to discuss it on a live platform instead of going back and forth all day long on Facebook. So I reached out to uh, Jeffrey and Brayden and JP and Mahler and see if they want to do it. They said, yeah, let's do it. So here we are and we're going to have fun. So let me bring these guys in so they can further introduce themselves to you guys. How you guys doing? Doing well. Good. Thank Good. you. <clears throat> Awesome. Glad to have you guys. Uh, JP, you were just on the show maybe about mm, about two or three weeks ago, about three weeks ago now, roughly. And so we had a lot of fun and we did get into a little bit of discussion of Calvinism there. Uh, and that was a fun discussion. Mauler, this is your first time being on the Gospel Truth, so welcome. Oh, I appreciate it, man. It's, it's nice to be here. I've seen your channel for many years. God bless you and the work that you do. So I'm happy to be here. All right, all right. And Jeffrey and Braden, this is your first time on the Gospel Truth, man. This is going to be fun. How y'all doing? Yep. Doing well, man. And, and I've been watching the Gospel Truth since you started this uh, network. I, I really enjoy everything that you do, brother. I, I appreciate you and I uh, hope the Lord blesses your ministry and you'll keep be able, you'll be able to keep having these wonderful debates for people like me as I work to listen to you. All right, yeah, and I echo what Jeff just said there. I, it's a blessing to watch what you do, and uh, it, and I'm doing better than I deserve to answer your original question. It's a blessing to be here tonight. All right, all right, JP. I didn't ask you how you were doing, man. We good, bro. How we you good, doing, good, JP? We, <laughs> you know, we chilling, bro. We chilling, man. Long story short, I was going back and forth with some of these fellas, and I got a text message in between everything saying, "Hey, JP." Want to bring it on the show? I was like, hey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This guy Marlon is working, man. 
I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I don't be commenting much on Facebook. You don't see me jumping to the, 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 the groups, but I certainly be surfing it. I'd be like, hmm, who's out there arguing now? Let me see. Let me see what we got, man. But great, yeah, yeah, right? Great stuff, guys. Great stuff. But before we jump into this, man, we're going to I'm gonna allow you guys to introduce yourselves, man. Tell them what you do, YouTube, blogs, websites, books, whatever it is, man. Let them know what you do, man. We start with Braden and Mr. Jeffrey. You guys got it, man. Go ahead and give a quick introduction to yourself. Yeah, so I uh, my name is Braden Patterson. I pastor a church named Valley Baptist Church in Hagerman, Idaho. It's a town uh, in southern Idaho. So if you live in that area, it'd be a blessing to see you this Lord's Day at 11 a.m. I also have a YouTube channel called Reformed Ex Mormon. Uh, just try to uh, proclaim the gospel there, share sermons, uh, evangelism, all that kind of stuff. I also am so blessed to be a part of a show with Jeff uh, here called Open Air Theology. We have a conference uh, that we did this year uh, from Shadows to Substance, where we talked about how Christ uh, is the fulfillment of all the things that the Old Testament was pointing towards. And this year, the upcoming uh, conference that we have in February of 2024 is Why Calvinism, uh, where we'll be taking uh, uh, different preachers, uh, some well-known, some not well-known like myself, uh, and just have the, the wonderfulness, the blessedness to be able to preach Christ crucified at that conference. So join us uh, February 2024, uh, Open Air Theology. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my name is Jeff Rice uh, or Jeffrey Rice, Jeff Rice, whichever. Uh, I'm a Christian husband, father, I'm a pastor of Covenant Reformed Baptist Church in Tallahoma, Tennessee. Uh, probably most well known for my uh, Bible crafting. Uh, I'm a Bible rebinder. Uh, I, an artist and owner of Post Tenderbrust Lux Bible Rebinding, and uh, as Braden alluded to, uh, him and I are co-host of a small channel called Open Air Theology. Uh, we come together because Braden and myself and our and our other co-hosts host at Haps Addison. We're all open air preachers, and we love to talk theology. And so we thought we'd come together and just combine the two and. Uh, yeah, as, again, I pastor uh, Covenant Reformed Baptist Church in Tallahoma, Tennessee. If you're ever in the area, please stop by. And if you're uh, if you want to know more about Calvin, Calvinism and the implications thereof, I, I would uh, encourage you to uh, come to the conference that we're having in February. And the pre-conference that we're having will be uh, hosted on one night, and it will be on the dangers of full preterism. So, <laughs> all right cool you thank you so much for that introduction and hope everyone comes check you out and sign up for that conference too it should be fun it should be fun all right mr jp yeah. and Mola, you guys are up go ahead give a quick introduction to yourselves you want to go first jp can you hear me J jp JP, log out jp where you at man nah, bro he's frozen go ahead Mola. have a little fun uh well I'm, I'm, gotcha. we're not uh my my resume is not going to look as slick as these gentlemen these gentlemen are ministers and pastors of a church i'm neither um uh, just run a youtube channel called the truth cartel christian commentary we talk about all topics obviously i'm not a calvinist that would be the the highlight. Then I run a Discord, uh, which would be the the ministry side of it. But it's uh, elders, brothers that get together and study the word, preach uh, uh, to each other, honestly, and pray for one another. And uh, that's been happening for the last couple of years in joint efforts too. Of course, I appear with JP and me and JP we've got history together. Uh, but yeah, we we appear together on each other's channels and we've known each other for a minute and we share a lot of the same views. So that's how we're connected. Anyways, go go ahead, JP. Yeah, a uh, long story short, my name is JP. Uh, was on YouTube a few years ago, had a decent sized platform. I took it down, came back two years later, and now I'm starting over from scratch. The platforms are growing, glory to God, and uh, got connected with Marlon. That's like a brother to me now. We we chat offline and things of that sort. Glad what he's doing with this platform. Obviously, it's growing. He's had some great hot debates, but we're going to blow those debates out the water with this one right here. I guarantee you that this one's going to be interesting. These uh, two guys that we're going to be talking to, they're no scrubs. They could present the Calvinism uh, perspective very clearly. They're Trinitarians and they're legitimate reform people. So uh, respect to them. Um, obviously, they're out here street preaching and doing things of the sort. And uh, I street preach as well, maybe not as much as those gentlemen, but I do it a little. 
And so I'm looking forward to uh, just representing our worldview and hopefully they can represent their worldview accordingly and everybody in the chat can come to their conclusions because these conversations are very, very important. Those guys are no punks, they're tough. Uh, I remember when I told uh, one of the brothers, uh, I don't know who, it, I think it was, um, one of the two brothers here, I forgot who I was debating again. I said, I'm gonna bring the smoke. And he said, well, I'm a fireman. So these guys are about the static and I love that, you know, all in, in, in good, um, in a good sense of humor. And we're gonna push forward and have a great conversation. All right. Yes, we are. We're going to have a fantastic conversation. So the way this conversation is going to work is that it's going to be more open discussion. And I will step in anytime I feel the question is not answered concisely or sort of not answering it clearly. I will step in. If one cuts each other off in mid question and mid answer, I will step in. So the idea is to make sure this discussion as an open forum is a discussion that's fruitful and everyone can be heard and get even level of talking. Uh, to answer the conversation. Also, I will present, so the way, also the way this open discussion is gonna work is that I'm gonna present the definition of each letter of the tulip. So total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. I will present the definition. I pray that you guys have actually looked at those definitions. So you guys are aware of those definitions. So when we present it, you guys have a full understanding of it. I definitely did want to spend time figuring out defining terms. So that is how we're gonna do this. Uh, so let's get right into it. We don't waste any, also we'll spend about 30 minutes for each letter of the tulip all right each each uh each doctor of the tulip all right so uh that's it we're going to jump right into it and the first one up is total depravity and the way that total depravity is defined is bring this thing up here all right so this is definition of total depravity because of because of the fall, man is unable of himself to savingly believe the gospel. The sinner is dead, blind, and deaf to the things of God. His heart is deceitful and desperately corrupt. His will is not free. It is in bondage to his evil nature. Therefore, he will not indeed, he cannot choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. Consequently, it takes much more than the Spirit's assistance to bring a sinner to Christ. It takes regeneration by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. Faith is not something man contributes to salvation, but it is, but is itself a part of God's gift of salvation. It is God's gift to the sinner, not the sinner's gift to God. All right. So we got the definition of total depravity out of the way, and this is going to be very helpful. And so I would like, you know, uh, start with JP and Muller. So what is your issue with, uh, total depravity? What you got? Can I go first Muller, and then you can, yeah, go ahead, JP. Yeah, go ahead. I'll say that the, the issue with total depravity is the, the fact that, uh, they say it's total inability. I believe that Romans chapter 10 makes it very clear that we have the ability. Uh, brothers, can you mute yourselves if you're not talking? Uh, the two brothers and the left, and then we'll do the same, obviously. Uh, uh, there's a bit of uh, feedback there. Uh, brother, uh, next to me, brother, with the glasses. Thank you. There we go. Perfect. There we go. So I would say that the issue I have with total depravity is that they say that you cannot respond. You don't have the ability to. But when we see the book of Romans, we do have the ability to. Romans chapter 10 says that faith comes by hearing. Right. So we see the element of hearing and responding. And therefore, that's how faith comes in. Right. It's hearing. Right. There is no such thing as you have to be regenerated first and then comes faith. And we see all through the scriptures, right? Romans chapter 11, how we have people that are grafted in, contingent, that they continue in belief, right? Otherwise, they'll be cut off again. So we see all through Romans, we see that Abraham was justified by faith. We see multiple examples, right? We see Lot in Genesis, right? God was giving him instructions, even though he was clearly not saved. We see that Lot had the ability to respond to good and evil, right? But not even going that far. We stick to the idea that you are unable to respond. And I believe all of Romans and all of the Bible gives us a clear indication that we can respond. Go ahead, Muller. 
Yeah, that to add on to that, I mean, to me, it's more it's, it's problematic, uh, and I agree with him on the point that we're unable. To me, passages about us preaching the gospel, persuading men uh, to salvation, meaning through the message of the gospel. I think ultimately what happens is when you say somebody by their own, of course, free will is, is loaded up because there is no free will um, uh, assumed in, in total depravity, right? Um, is that if there is no free will, um, you cannot choose. So persuasion, the gospel message itself, to me, I think it takes the power from the message of the gospel. Because it's what it says is that the message, therefore, is empty, because the person is really not coming to the message of the gospel in itself. What they're doing is they're simply being regenerated to then have faith to believe a message. So that's kind of my issue in terms of what it does to the gospel. But I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I would I would say I think um, JP and and what you just uh, said there with one of the issues is is that in total depravity it's the teaching that uh, we cannot respond. I I would say that I think that that's an incorrect view of what total depravity is because we would say as Calvinists that we can respond, but it's always going to be in a, a way that's consistent with our nature, and our nature uh, does not know the depths of the Spirit of God, and they are foolishness to us. And so we would say that our nature is by nature children of wrath from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, 1 through 5, really. And so the ways that we respond are going to be consistently uh, showing that we are unable to please God with anything that we respond with. And we are still needing the Spirit to make us alive so that our response can be acceptable to God. Um, because everything that we do is sin and trespass. And that includes even uh, faith preceding regeneration in those ways. Yeah, I would say when it comes to this subject, um, you know, by bringing in faith, faith is, is you know, it, it's the idea that if regeneration precedes faith, Calvinism is true. If faith precedes regeneration, Calvin is false, right? I think that everyone would agree there, correct? All right, so, but the idea here, you know, that that we present in Ephesians chapter 2, which tells us that you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. And that would be Satan. And it says the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, speaking of Satan, among whom you formerly conduct yourselves in the lust of the flesh, doing the desires of your flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So that mind there, it speaks of imagination, meaning that those who are not in the body of Christ, their their, their mind is being, I mean, uh, so, so just picture a car pulling a a trailer, right? So so as Satan, uh, uh, and our mind is this trailer, and Satan is the truck, and our and our mind is being pulled by Satan, and because our mind is desiring the things of the flesh, our flesh follows after the things of our mind, right? And so because we are uh, uh, not in the body of Christ, we cannot please God, such as with faith. And I'll give a a, a little definition of, of of faith, and here's where I think the mistake is being made. I believe y'all are seeing faith in the same way of everyday faith, which I would call experience faith, experiential faith. You know, uh, so I'm sure both of y'all got driver's license. And uh, and how do you know when you get into your car that you hit the gas, it's going to go, or when you hit the brake, it's going to stop? You know so because you saw your mom or dad get into a car, hit the gas, it went, hit the brake, and it stopped. Right. So you experience that. And whenever you got your drivers and you hit the you knew of the experience you had from your mom and dad driving, when you hit the gas, it would go, the brake, it will stop. All right. Mm -hmm. So that kind of faith, every man is born with a measure of faith. But when it comes to that we're talking about here in responding, it's not an experienced faith. People believe that the God of all eternity, who created the heavens and the earth, entered into time, the infinite became finite, took on flesh, 
uh, lived the life that we could not live, died the death that we should die, rose again on the third day, <clears throat> ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he's coming back again. We've never experienced anything like this. And if you was to just take one part of it, one portion of that, and say, say death, right? So, so, so what if I was to say, like, like if we experience death, like, oh, Billy Bob died yesterday. Tomorrow, I wonder if he's going to rise from the grave like Joe did last week, right? If that was the case, it would be experience faith. But because it's not something we experience, it's we cannot just have faith in it. God entered into time, took on flesh, lived the life we could not live, died the death that we should die, was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended, and he's coming back. We cannot mm -hmm. just believe that. It's scientifically impossible. All right, thank you. I didn't want to cut you in because of the no. small yeah. little delay, but let me respond to uh, the brother under you, um, who his name, what's your name again, bro? Robertson? Braden. Braden? Okay, got it. Yeah, so let me respond to Braden in this regard. Braden, I'm not saying that you cannot respond, right? What I am saying is the order in which the response is made. I believe that the response is made before regeneration, as the gentleman above you stated. So just to clarify that, I'm not saying that Calvinists say that we believe that you can't or whatever. What I'm saying is, is that we believe that you can respond, but the response comes before regeneration, then regeneration comes after. So obviously you guys believe that you can respond, but the regeneration comes first. So just for the audience and everybody, just so we're clear, to respond to the uh, to the uh, uh, brother on the top, I'll say this. I don't see that particular distinction of faith that you're talking about in Scripture. We agree that men are evil and wicked. We agree with that. However, I also believe that God has the power and God has actualized the world in which although we are heading towards a path of death, God has made it very clear and God has given everybody an opportunity to be able to respond to that message that can ultimately save them. Now, obviously, we've heard of the lifeboat example where you're in a sinking ship and God throws the life, uh, the lifeline and he says, hey, come by and, and, and grab that. So I'll respond by saying, yeah, I think that our desires are bad. Our desires are not good. Being in the flesh is not a great thing. It's we desire bad things, but God intervened and he gave those people the ability to respond so that they no longer head down that trajectory. Anything you want to add to that moment? Yeah. So I appreciate the analogies. My, my biggest issue, especially with total depravity, is that, it, you know, and, and like you said, you said it, uh, Jeff, you said it perfect when I think you said um, essentially if if regeneration before faith isn't um isn't true then calvinism is not true um and just paraphrasing you so i agree with that so my biggest issue is that when i read the bible i'm going to have to know that and the the passages in the old testament starting from you know some more some of the more famous ones joshua 24 choose you mm -hmm. you continue to see a choice being made now i'm not yep. at the position Sorry. that nothing that god does nothing in this this uh this relationship no we know that god calls all men jesus draws all men to him so that drawing is there the proposition of the gospel has to be made however my my biggest issue is with the plain reading of the text i can't say it is a free choice i cannot say that these verses make sense in light of the idea that the the statement for total depravity is that man contributes uh, nothing, meaning towards in terms of faith. It's not a choice that he's making. It's simply playing a role or, or let's say, a, a scene in a movie. And unfortunately, I don't have scripture that tells me that that's what's happening. I can appreciate the experience and what you described if you did give me good analogies, but I reject them just on the plain reading of the text, at least at least T. The other ones, of course, we'll go into. We might have some other problems, but that's my that's why I'm uncomfortable. But you did shed some light and then you kind of expressed a little bit more detail as to what total depravity is the way the way you see it. So I appreciate that. But that's my issue. If I'm reading the Bible, 
I'm not picking up what you gentlemen are saying. Could I be taught yeah. it in a systematic? Absolutely. And I would say that most people wouldn't come to this conclusion. They have to be taught systematic theology. That's why the first 300 years of the church, this wasn't a thing. Augustine comes along and makes it a thing. So that would that would be my pushback and, and my statement there. Yeah, so would you say that, uh, if you don't mind me asking you a question, would you say that uh, uh, people rising from the dead is sci like, like in our culture, it's scientifically impossible, right? If someone's died and has died, they're put into a grave. We don't expect them to come out of the grave three days later. Like that's something that we don't experience. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a miracle for sure. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's a miracle. And and that's just like like in the in the analogy that I gave you, which is what I did was I preached to you the gospel, right? Uh, that one thing being dead and buried, that, that is the one thing that is more likely to happen than the other. That, that one might be even easier to believe than the others, right? We're saying that God himself entered into time. The infinite became finite. Right, the Creator entered into creation, and, and so on and so forth. And because we don't have an experience of this happening, we just cannot make ourselves believe these things, right? And and, and on the issue of Joshua twenty four, when it talks about sir, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve, well, Joshua is speaking to God's covenant people. They are already His people. And he is telling them to make a choice and serve. As a pastor, I stand in my pulpit every week and I can tell people, not necessarily in those words, you, you profess to be in the new covenant, serve Christ, live for him. I'm not calling them, like if I know they're Christian, they're in the new covenant, I'm not calling them to become a Christian. And, 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 and Joshua was not calling them to become an Israelite. They became an Pastor, Israelite when uh, they were born. Pastor, yeah. respectfully, did anybody make that argument, choose whom you may serve? Did you make that argument, Muller? Someone brought up that. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah I, I, I quoted the verse, but the the, yeah. the brother's presupposition is going to shoot that down. He's talking about in context how he, he would preach it to, you know, to a congregation of Calvinists. But it still doesn't deal mm -hmm. with the text. Yeah. Even if he's no, talking no, 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 to no, the, the well, nation well, of Israel. simply just... Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. He's simply no. I'm just going to finish this point. And say, he wasn't going he, to even the Jebusites. Oh, right. Totally get it. But you would agree that there's elect, meaning Israelites, that were wiped out by God in judgment, correct? The disobedient right. Israelites, correct? All right. So the there, the, the verse stands. You'd be speaking to them even yeah. in in just overall context. But go ahead, though. Yeah. I don't know, Brayden. You have something you want to add to that, or I can keep going. Yeah, I, you know that I think that's exactly if if we are in any context of any church, whether it's Calvinistic or not, like that is the duty of the pastor, I think, to tell people to follow after Christ, right? And so, uh, what we're saying is is that as New Covenant members, that statement still stands um, mm -hmm. because there's people in my, I mean, myself, day by day, I have to tell myself serve the Lord, right? Like there's, there's times where I'm going to fall into sin. And so that's a reminder for people. And so, um, that, that, that's, that's really what we would go with is that it's not, uh, choosing, uh, for salvation, the Lord, it's choosing to serve the Lord that you're already a part of the covenant. in. And so in the new covenant, you're made uh, a member of the new covenant with God writing his law upon your heart and upon your, his mind. And that uh, we know God and, the, and we are known by him. Hebrews chapter 8, verse uh, 8 through 12 talk about this. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 also does as well. And so what we're saying is that the, the new heart has already came, but we still need that constant reminder, serve the Lord. The Lord choose today to continue to serve the Lord. Um, so it, it, what Jeff's trying to say is that there's a, co a consistency that goes throughout old covenants, which is covenants of work, and then in the new covenant, uh, which is uh, those who believe in Christ. Uh, thank you for that. But let me just say this. I just don't see in the scriptures whenever evil people are told to repent or whenever evil people are told to choose God. I don't see in scripture that that's just selective to the elect or particular people that God chose before the foundations of the world. I think that's a systematic that's been added to the text. 
Whenever God tells people, repent of your sins, come to Christ, or Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. It's not talking about particular elect people before the foundations of the world. I take the text for what it says. I don't read into the text and assume that the text is saying just for particular elects. And in addition to what you guys are saying about how you would preach at a church, I understand that you would preach at a church and just tell the whole church to um, repent or accept Christ or what have you. I understand that. But it's with the lens that there are some people that are elect and some that are not. From our position, everybody in that church has the ability and opportunity to accept the gospel. Because when the gospel spread, when the gospel is given to people, there is no kind of distinction made where it's secretly just for the elect. It's for all people. The grace of God has been given for all. And so that would be my position. Go ahead, Morris. All right. Yeah. All right. So, so it seems like we're already jumping off into election. I want to make sure we're staying right here in, in total depravity. We're talking about the condition of man, the depravity of man's heart, um, uh, the, their, their insistence or lack thereof of resist, resisting the gospel. I don't want to be flowing off into election. That's not what this conversation right now is about. So uh, let's talk about the condition of man. That's the, that's the vibrant area we need to stay in. Well, I just want to touch on. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to say, so the, so the condition of man, uh, I don't think we would disagree that man or we're in a sinful war because what Romans 5 says, that because of one man's sin, sin entered into the world, and we know that's a power, because of that, every man sins. So we're in agreement that, they're, that uh, you know, mankind now is susceptible to, to this power and has to operate in a world where they're under this power and therefore we all sin. We get that. But uh, I don't think the disagreement there, the disagreement is when you come to total depravity is that um, there's, there's something uh, it, it's all about choice. I believe it cancels out every verse where a choice is, is, is to be made to choose God or to not choose him. We're not talking about just simply sanctification, but choosing to follow God. So this stays within total depravity. Of course, I don't want to go to election. The question is, why can't any part of the choice um, happen in total depravity? And it's because something has to happen before even a choice can be made. But I'd argue, even if a choice is made after regeneration, it's not a real choice. So that's, yeah. that's the issue, is that choosing these verses... Don't fit, and I think that total depravity, the doctrine, cancels too many verses that 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 uh, tell tell man to choose and make a decision. But that's that's my yeah, so I I appreciate that. So I think what you guys are, and I'm trying my best to understand what you guys are saying is mm -hmm. that you're looking at the text where there's application that's going on. People are preaching the gospel in the public square. Why are they Why are they preaching it? in the sense of choose today, like choose to believe in Christ. And I think one of the ways that I would look at it, and, and I and I don't want to wrongfully assume what you guys would believe, but in Jeff and my belief is that we say that Jesus Christ is the second person in the Trinity, has all divine attributes. He, he exists in the form of God fully, even when he was in the flesh. And so Christ, when he knows all things, he's going and entering into the city of Galilee is what Mark 1 says in Matthew chapter 3 it says he enters into the city of Galilee knowing all things we know that as a presup of who Christ is because he's the word made flesh he goes into the city of Galilee uh, preaching repent and believe in the gospel for the kingdom of God is hand so even Jesus himself was preaching to people that he knew would not have faith in him. And so what I, where I would go with this is that the text that you're looking at, where it seems to be that, is the applica application of how everybody should preach. I think it's Spurgeon that says if, if we had on the back of our backs uh, sheep written out and goat written out there, evangelism would look a lot different. We'd be going and pulling up people's shirts rather than telling them to repent and believe in the gospel. Since I can't do that, and I'm definitely not God and I don't know all things, I should still follow the example that Jesus Christ set out. And so what our... Uh, where I, we would go for total depravity is not in necessarily the text that shows application, but in the text that teaches the doctrine of man's state. 
um, which that like Ephesians 2, I like we already quoted from that would be a text that we'd go to Romans 5, as you made mention of that we are are, are slaves to sin. Um, there's several occasions like that where it's more doctrine rather than the application for evangelism. Jeff, you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I just want to, you know, like like they're talking about response. You know, we have to be response able. Um, you know, the old covenant wasn't anything different. Like they were told to keep the law in order to live, and they were not able to respond positively. Right? They could not keep the law. You couldn't. You cannot keep the law. I cannot keep the law. No one can keep the law and live. So it's not uncommon for God to call us to do something that we are so able to do, right? Mm. Whenever I received Christ by faith, right? I received the Holy Spirit. And through that the Holy Spirit causes me to keep the law of God. And even, even though I have the Holy Spirit, I'm still not able to keep it perfectly. But God sees me perfectly righteous in christ i see myself as a ruined sinner even still today mm. but god sees me as christ and one day i'll see myself the way god sees me but 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 the idea that that it that if god uh causes us calls us in the gospel to make a decision to repent and believe like like you're only looking at one side of it but it's the same thing that's take, that took place in the Old Covenant. They had to keep the law in order to live, right? If you break the law, you could be removed from the land. We see that take, take place the two or three times in the Testament. They could not keep the law. They were removed from the land. Certain commandments, if you broke them, say adultery or blasphemy, they would kill them. They would strap them down to the ground, shaped as an X, and stone them. They could not keep the law, and neither can we. So, so, so to say that we within ourselves can respond positively to anything such as keeping the law or repent and believe, I just, I don't see it anywhere in the text at all. Now, all right. of, of course, let me finish. Before. So, so of course there's two sides, right? So hyper Calvinism, they focus on the sovereignty of God only. They do not mention the responsibility of men. All right. And non-Calvinists, they focus on the responsibility of man. Me being reformed, I say both are true. God is sovereign and we are responsible. Right. So we'll that's how we say that but, I, but I understand that I cannot respond unless Marlon, God can you get some time on this, faith. Marlon? Marlon, let's can try. you get some time on this? Because I yeah, love the let's... brothers. Yeah, let's, let's 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 make sure let's make sure that we're 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 not too long winded in your explanation. We want to make sure we get a full fledged conversation. So, JP, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I like to respond to both the gentlemen. Look, I'm gonna respond in 45 seconds, fellas. 45 seconds. Listen, I know you both are pastors, and you guys got the preaching gene in you guys. Listen, I'm not I'm not coming at you guys for that. I know you're a pastor, but in 45 seconds or less, let me respond to Brandon in the bottom. Brandon, in regard to your example about the stripes, which it says elect or not elect, I'd argue and say that Jesus Christ knows ultimately who's going to be saved. He has perfect foreknowledge. Now, you're entering this with the presupposition of determinism. So you believe that everything's determined, and I don't want to go there yet. I believe we will eventually. But you believe everything's determined and there's election. I'm saying even though Jesus knows who's ultimately going to be saved or not, it doesn't mean that those people didn't have that opportunity. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have preached to them. Yes, John chapter 6 and other parts of the Bible and John, uh, they speak about people who are hardened or blind. But they became blind and they became hardened and they can't be drawn because they rejected the Messiah. So just because God ultimately knows who will be saved, uh, it doesn't mean that the people who won't be saved don't have an opportunity to respond to that gospel. Ultimately, they didn't. God is sovereign. God knows who will and who will not be saved. And to respond to the, bro uh, the, the pastor up on top, I will say in response to what you're saying that, yes, I understand that in Israel, right, uh, back in those days in the Old Testament, they couldn't keep the law perfectly. But what I believe Mueller's point was is that these guys were elect, 
correct? And I understand, Marlon, you said you don't want us to talk about election yet. Well, you know, it's too bad because he brought it up. So let me just deal with it, and then we'll be finished here, and then we'll let Marlon respond. So in regard to election, Mar uh, Mar Mar Mar's point was, although they were elect, some of these guys still perish. So if there are elect people perishing, how can then we how can then we say that oh uh, you know uh, these guys um, you know if you're elect you'll always be well you'll persevere till the end so that's just what I'm trying to clarify here uh, a minute to one forty five no sir go ahead Mueller. Uh yeah, I just reiterating the point. I think total depravity, where we see a difference in the point that, that Braden was talking about, was we understand that there is a process of giving a message, telling people to follow God, even though they are somebody who's been regenerated before faith. We get that. We're going to touch on that point in a minute. I totally get it. I just I want to say that for all intents and purposes, even when we're dealing with free choice, total depravity, it isn't real. It's not really happening according to what all of Scripture is saying by, by, by your view in total depravity. Those things are asserted by your, by your systematic, and therefore to make a statement that people are actually choosing, that people are actually moving to do so because of the presupposition you think is a, a man is so incapable of responding to something. Um, I just think it's problematic and it starts sort of a snowball that can get out of control and then takes us obviously to the other points. But I, I just, I, I think it's very tough to read the Bible that way. And unless you're taught that you're not going to, you're not going to get that from the text, um, especially the reading the, the Bible in its entirety. So that's, that's always going to be my pushback on total depravity until we get to the other points. Yeah, so real quick, if I can, uh, y'all are conflating the two covenants. So the old covenants for an earthly, uh, an earthly people, an earthly covenant people. This was not salvific. This was just about land promises and and a people that would that, that the Christ would come from. Uh, the new covenant is salvific. Everyone who is saved in the old covenant, they're saved through the new covenant by what Jesus Christ has done. And and, mm -hmm. and and I want to point out something real quick. So if you look at First Timothy chapter six, thirteen through sixteen, I won't read it for the second time, but it mentions Jesus Christ and God the Father, and it says that they dwell in unapproachable right. light. John six forty four says, "No one." Jesus says, "No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day." John fourteen six says, "Jesus said uh, to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to me.'" And no one can come to the Father except through Him, right? So if, mm -hmm. if, if the Father and God, the Father, if the Father and Jesus dwell in unapproachable light, and no one can come to the Father unless it's Jesus, and no one can come to Jesus unless they're drawn by the Father, how do we get to God? The, the, there leaves no opening. There's not a crack in the window. He's unapproachable. <laughs> he must do something so that we can receive Him, Braden. Right? Yeah, I I, pro I know we're probably buttoning up on the time for T. Marlon, do I have a second just to just to respond? I, I want to. Yeah, we have about we I have about just... two minutes left. All right, okay, well, I'll well, try to I'll response. try to keep it under I want a minute. Mueller to respond. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So JP, on something that you said that you you said God ultimately knows who will be saved, right? Uh, that's what I heard you say that God ultimately knows. Yeah, because he has perfect foreknowledge. Faith. So if he ultimately knows that, he was still preaching to everybody, repent and believe in the gospel, even knowing that there would be mm -hmm. people that would reject the message. And so that's mm -hmm. what, as Calvinists, we're saying God has elected a people for himself. And when the, the preacher who does not know all things, they are to still be preaching the gospel, yeah. knowing that God will, uh, hearing uh, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so we are to preach the gospel. We're to be vessels in those ways and let God regenerate hearts. Mm -hmm. Muller, uh, let Braden, me just I say appreciate this. that. Yeah, go, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to hit two points. No, let me hit two points real quick before they slip. Okay, so first of all, even if Jesus, the group that he was preaching to, there was also people that weren't going to believe there, and Jesus knew that they weren't going to believe. So I think your point is moot when you when you turn around and and pitch it this way. So the reason people must hear the gospel, or they have to hear the gospel, at least even in both of our views. Um, is because that would that would 
That would actually be justice. Somebody hears the message of the gospel and rejects it. Secondly, we understand salvation. We're not disagreeing that salvation doesn't come through Christ. That's what Galatians 3.8 mm -hmm. says in the gospel that was preached to Abraham. So we don't disagree with that. The question is, there's elect in the Old Testament. Those elect were wiped out by God in judgment somewhere. Okay? My mm -hmm. question is, those elect were wiped out. Then that means we have a definition of elect in the Old Testament. I mean, you, you can say, no, there were Israelites that were taken out by God. Okay? And we have elect in the New Testament. If you're going to tell me, oh, it works differently for that term elect, I have no problem. You're just going to have to present scripture for that argument. Go ahead, JP. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let, me, let me finish. Yeah, final, let me, let final, me word, final, final word from JP, then we're going to transition to unconditional election. All right, so I'll just say this. I hear your perspective, fellas. I just don't see it in the scripture. I think that people who are depraved can respond I think that to say that they have no ability to respond, I, I just see in the Bible that they have that ability. And I understand God knows all things, but it doesn't mean they don't have the ability. In other words, God knows who ultimately is going to press the button and not press the button. It doesn't mean they couldn't press the button if they wanted to. So that's just for me. I believe that in with total depravity. And all, I believe you can respond. I think the scriptures make it clear. And uh, faith comes by hearing. And so, therefore, this is why we preach the gospel. This is why you guys preach the gospel. Ultimately, I don't agree with you guys, but I believe faith does come by hearing. And I don't think it's because God has a particular group of elect. I think some people ultimately respond and ultimately they don't. And it's not because they were elected before the foundations of the world. You guys can get right. the last word on the, next, on the next letter, just to be fair. Yes, yes. All right, all right. So now we're transitioning to unconditional election. And unconditional election is defined as the following God's choice of certain individuals into salvation before the foundations of the world rested solely in his own sovereign will. His choice of particular sinners was not based on any foreseen response or obedience on their part, such as faith, repentance, etc. On the contrary, God gives faith and repentance to teach and each in, uh, repentance to each individual whom he selected. These acts are the result, not the cause of God's choice. Election, therefore, was not determined by or conditioned upon any virtuous quality or act foreseen in men. Those whom God sovereignly elected, he brings through the power of the spirit to a willingly accepting uh, to a willingly acceptance of Christ. Thus, God's choice of the sinner, not the sinner's choice of Christ is the ultimate cause of salvation all right so we 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 see that definition there and so last round uh jp and Mahler took first so um brayden and jeffrey do you guys want to continue that thought on that definition and sort of explain uh your textual references and so forth uh, concerning unconditional election jeff you want to start or you want me to yeah, let's start with the the covenant, and I'll let you take the the the, the, the lead. So, so 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 we believe that there's an overarching covenant throughout all of uh, all of existence, right? And, and it took well, excuse me, it took place between the Godhead. So, so we believe that God the Father purposed to save a people. God the Son accomplishes that purpose by taken on flesh, living the life we could not live, dying the death that we should die, being buried, rose again on the third day, and ascended back into heaven. The Holy Spirit applies the purpose. What purpose is that? To save a people through the message of Jesus Christ. Right. That's why you and I, we go out and we preach the gospel, because God has purpose to save a people through the sacrifice, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. And it's the message of His Son that the Holy Spirit saves the people, right? That message, like Lydia says, that as Paul was preaching to Lydia, God opened her heart to receive the message. And so we hold to what's called the covenant of redemption and everything hangs in the balance what happened in eternity past when the Father purposed to save. Brayden? Yeah, so, you know, I... I... And I don't want to speak too far in advance without knowing uh, what JP and Mahler's position is exactly on this. And so I'm going to speak in thinking that you that you hold to something uh, to middle knowledge to some effect, because I heard JP say something that 
uh, he foresaw the faith or something along those lines in the in the in the tea. Um, but my mind takes me to two places. If if our election is based off of God foreseeing our faith, I think then we would have something to boast of before God. So Ephesians two it says, "For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast." And Romans nine, ultimately Romans nine is where I would go to to, to build the argument. Uh, fully and thoroughly, which is verse 11. Uh, For though the twins were not yet born and had done anything good or bad, so the purpose of God according to choice would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. Um, I'm not going to read the entirety of this text for, for time purposes. I hope we can read it here in a little bit, but 18 through 24, I think, really show that that God being the potter, being the creator, all these things that we see in scripture, uh, he has the right because of his aseity, he's in a class completely other than ourselves, that he has the right to shape us, to mold us to his own purposes. And in, in Romans 9, it talks about those purposes, those end purposes as vessels for destruction and vessels of mercy. And, and so that is the, the, the point of unconditional election, that I am the chief of sinners, that there's nothing in me that God would ever look down and see as I should grant him faith, I should favor him, I should save him, or anything along those lines. But just through his mercy, I was made alive together in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me say this, Mola, real quick. Let's just say that we disagree on Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Uh, where Lydia was granted the ability to listen to the message, right? So God did grant her that ability, but it wasn't an ability for salvation. Acts chapter 16 says, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of uh, Tyria. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Tyteria, is that correct? Sariah? I don't know. know. Whatever. (laughs) Let's carry on. A seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. So the text says she was already a worshiper of God. Then the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So her heart was open to pay attention to what Paul was saying, not for a particular salvation. That's Acts 16, chapter 14, uh, Acts 16, verse 14. Uh, In addition to that, I'll say this. I don't go around saying, ha, 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 um, you know, I saved myself or I don't go around boasting. You know, I was as worthless as a cockroach and I received the the gospel that, that was given to me. And ultimately I became regenerated, right? By listening to the gospel, listening to sermons and things of that sort, ironically by people like James White, <laughs> out of all people, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, um, you know, that's how I came to Christ. I don't go around boasting, you know what I'm saying? And if there are any people that go around boasting, you know, shame on them because you didn't do anything to earn your salvation. It's not by works. It's by the grace of God. And so no man can boast in the scripture is very clear. So I hope that I clarify that because there is a there is, a, you know, a worldview that thinks that we go around bragging about our salvation. And there are people that do, you know what I'm saying? But that's not us. Go ahead, Mueller. Hey, so, Mueller, before, before you say took, something, do you mind if I just ask something about what JP just said there real quick? Or, actually, or yeah, do you no. want to go? I just, just real quick, just real, real quick. I, so I don't want to try to say that I'm painting JP or Mueller in a, in a bad light or saying that you guys are saying something. But however, even what you just said, though, JP, I think that that does show boasting because you said I was regenerated because I listened to something. Um, that, that, yeah, I, you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I so I don't want to. I just yeah, want to yeah. insert that. that no, yeah, I can deal with it. I can deal with Romans, it. Go ahead. Yeah, Romans ahead. 10 says faith comes comes by hearing. So I simply heard, which is something I did, and then that's how my faith came. Go ahead, Mola. Okay. And, and how I would press back again is agree that that the the line can get if we're not defining just the terms. But Ephesians two eight, it's pretty. Uh, 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 there's we're not boasting in works. Faith is is not a work, right? So it says it's through faith. The question here is, when it comes to unconditional election, is what is faith, right? It's tied to it because if we see faith as one being God gives you this process ahead of time, right? He has to regenerate you. Then you that you call that that process faith, and then you come to my side, and I'm saying no, faith is something. Right, that you that has to be sparked, right, by the gospel, 
And that is a work of God. He's presenting it to you. Faith would be, I have to believe in that message. The question is, your process versus my process, we're both presupposing some things. Where I would say is, in unconditional election that you hear, is you mentioned Romans chapter 9, and I know that that's the the, the text that even, um, even Augustine and some of the, the folks beforehand who came up, I would say, with the beginning of this theology, is I have a totally different view on Romans 9. So you're looking mm-hmm. at Romans 9 thinking it's talking about salvation, and I can clearly see that those folks are being chosen, um, and the first 13 verses there is to explain how the Christ came and how the, the Jews shouldn't boast that they believe it's through their bloodline or their works. Um, so that's how I would see it differently there. But, but uh, yeah, faith is not a work, so we don't go around boasting. What we're simply saying is that we believe that Scripture states that God calls us, and you can either choose to respond or deny. And I believe that that's how true justice and love can be shown or uh, can be seen in God, in God's nature. Without it, I find it very difficult to uh, make man responsible for something uh, that they didn't do or that they didn't choose. So that's that's my thought on it. Go ahead, brother. Would you would you say that everybody that has faith is regenerated? Mm-hmm. Everybody would. that has faith, no, they have, to have in faith Christ. in Christ. Yeah, faith yeah. Everybody Christ that has faith in Christ. Would you say everybody that has faith in Christ? following faith in Christ, they are regenerated. I mean, now now we're talking about terms of faith because even the demons believe, right? Right. So right. Um, so that would be that would be, you know, a mental ascent to let's say a simplistic idea of Jesus. No. Understanding what Christ did and then also what Romans chapter one describes is when God is calling to your conscience, right? That you are responding and understanding you are in sin. I think that there's there's another uh, level of that, and that would come through repentance. So I th- I believe regenerate faith, if we're going to describe it, comes with a conviction of the Holy Spirit and uh, and repentance. But I could have faith in an idea. There's plenty of people. I mean, Muslims believe in Jesus. Question is, what Jesus and uh, what level do they believe in him? They don't believe he's the Son of God. So that's why I'd push back on that. Mm. Nor do they believe that he no, it was God who entered into time and flesh, lived the life they could not live, took upon himself Correct. the death that they should die. They rose on the third day because they cannot believe that because it hasn't been granted to them to believe that. Now, uh, I, I want to go off at what uh, Braden was saying because we see in John 8 that after Jesus is preaching this message that he is the light of the world, Right, that you know, and in, in the same way that the Israelites follow the cloud by day and the and, and the fire by night, they are to follow him. He preaches this message and he says, Unless you believe that, that he, he is that you're gonna die in your sins. And in verse 30, it says that that you know, many believed in him. And Jesus goes on to say, You know, that if you believe in my word, if you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciple. I want to touch on real quick is verse 38. It says, Jesus speaking, as I was speaking these things which I seen with my Father, therefore uh, you also do the things which you have from your Father. And in verse 44, he tells them who his, their Father is, which is the devil. He says, your Father is the devil, and you want to do the desires of your Father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand the truth brother? because there is no truth in him. That's this John, is, uh, 8, John 8, John 8, 4. But but verse 47, and it tells you why that he rejects their belief. Verse 47, he who is of God hears my words. Here's the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not. Of, he is speaking to Israelites who had just said to believe in him, actually to believe that he was God, because he said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Jeffy. All right. So I would say uh, in regard to John chapter 8, um, I would say who is he talking to, right? What is the context the Jews. of John? Covenant. Covenant yeah, Jesus. but, you know, in perfect context, right? If we're reading John chapter 8, we know that the I can Pharisees, give you perfect context. Yeah, yeah. We would say that I can the give you Pharisees, perfect context. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would say that. 
I would say that the Pharisees are the ones that deny Christ and their and the Pharisees' father, right? And the higher up in the scribes, their father is the devil. So the Pharisees who the, who rejected Christ, who denied Christ, yes, their father is the devil. And because their father is the devil, that's why they cannot be drawn. I believe that in, I believe it's John chapter 8, Mola, we went over this not too long ago. It was prophesied that the Pharisees would not believe. It was foreknown, it was prophesied, and therefore that's why they cannot be drawn. Go ahead, Moeller. Uh, yeah, well, in context, in John chapter 8, even, you know, I don't have a problem saying that they're Jews, but John chapter 6 gives us the context as well. It tells us who are those that are drawn and those that the Father taught and learned. So... I don't have a problem with this. This text doesn't 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 change. This text doesn't tell me John chapter eight doesn't tell me that God has to choose you for salvation before the foundations of the world. Does it say that it's difficult for a group of Jews um, or the religious elite, the Pharisees, right, for them to believe? Well, sure. I mean, obviously, we see prophecy ahead of time saying that they're they're hardened, but already. Uh, their unbelief, right? Because some of them knew the work he was doing and they still didn't believe, right? Matthew 12. So uh, even if I'm coming to John chapter 8, my issue is is that unconditional election is not talked about in this chapter. And in many chapters, it isn't. Like I said, the prominent text would be Romans 9 and John 6 to, to, to begin to pr prove that from your side. Say again. Verse 47, For, verse 47, says, he who hears, hears a, yeah, he, he who he, is of God, he hears he, of God. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right. So it says he who is of God, hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Correct. And John right. chapter six says those who are of God, those that were taught and learned from the father. So I don't have a problem with that. Hmm. Go ahead, gentlemen. I yield. Yeah. I, I would go. I would go back to, to Romans nine on it. I do think we kind of got off on to uh, maybe even some irresistible grace uh, topic on there. I, I do. I do think though uh, one term that you you use, Mahler, that we we would use continually is is regenerate faith. Uh, you, you said that. I don't know if you caught that or not, but that 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 is the type of. Uh, and you said that. Yeah, I was. I, I, I Bra Braden. I was. I was. Yeah. Braden. Sorry to cut you off, but I want to let you okay, know good. I'm using it because I know I'm speaking to a Calvinist. That's why. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Know. So in. Yeah. Yeah. For in sure. James. Yeah. For sure. For sure. I, and I. I don't think that you didn't know that. Um, but James two, uh, where it talks about that, it's, it's, it's faith that is dead. It's faith that actually really isn't alive. And so that's what I think that maybe would have been better to focus on on and maybe total depravity because that's what we're what I was trying to talk about in Ephesians two is that one can have faith, and not be regenerate that because their faith is actually dead. It's a, it's a, it's trespasses and sin. It's, it's that mental ascent. They can acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. They can see the signs, but it's actually a dead faith because they, they, they have not been regenerated. And so that's what, when we talk about, so maybe, I don't know. I don't want to keep on going on that because I know we're talking about unconditional election. So if you guys wouldn't mind, you mind if we go back to Romans nine? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. By all means. Yeah. So, so Romans nine, uh, the text I already read in Romans nine eleven about the two twins. Um, uh, so I'll just read it for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad. So the purpose of God, according to his choice would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. And I know we have time constraints. So I just want to read uh, verse. Uh, let's see. It's verse. I think it's verse 21 to, I think, no, it's 18 to 24. You guys mind if I read 18 to 24? Mm -hmm. No, by all means, brother. Good. Okay. Uh, so then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who looks back to God? Will the thing molded say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Or does not the potter 
have authority over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. And what if God, wanting to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath having been prepared for destruction, and in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. I would argue that this is this is teaching unconditional election that that before creation even took place that God had a plan to save a people like Jeff said earlier and in that plan it also consisted of people uh, reprobate individuals people that would not come to have faith in him uh, people that would continually reject him and stay dead as Ephesians 2 would say stay totally depraved is what we would argue from um, maybe I'll just read it and I'll pass it whoever's next. Well, let me, I mean, there's no way Pastor will be able to respond to all of that and the pastor on top. So if maybe we can just respond to this and then pastor, you can get the last one. Yeah, I'll take care of Romans 9 if you want. All right, go ahead. Can I just make no, a comment? No, no, if you want, you go no? first. Yeah, you go first. Okay, yeah, go, go first. Yeah. So in regard to, and we'll, let me just speed through this real quickly because we have time constraints. So verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Romans chapter 11 tells us who he'll have mercy on and who he'll have compassion on. So this is not a mystery. It's only a mystery if we stop at Romans 9. Romans chapter 11, which if I do get an opportunity tomorrow, then I'll read what I'm talking about. And then obviously in verse 11, Right where it says, though they were not yet born, they had nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. This is not talking about salvation, right? This is not talking about salvation. If we continue to read verse 13, uh, verse 15, um, well, actually, we just read that. Uh, verse 17, for, for the scripture says, Pharaoh, for what the very purpose I raised you, that I might show my power in you, that my, my, my might may be proclaimed on the earth. So then um, he has mercy in whoever he wills and he hardens whoever he wills. We see that the Pharaoh had multiple opportunities mm. not to fall into the, the given over state. So we know he had multiple opportunities. So, uh, yes, Pharaoh was raised. Right. And God's purpose was shown through Pharaoh. But God's purpose can be shown through anybody. God can use anything to show his purposes. And we know that Pharaoh had multiple opportun multiple opportunities and I don't want to go here, but we believe Pharaoh hardened his own heart first. I don't want to go there. We don't have enough time, but we can if, if Marlon permits. Uh, let's continue. So you, you're saying that this isn't about salvation, though, because it talks about mercy on whom I will have mercy, compassion on yeah, whom I will Yeah, but Romans, Romans chapter 11 tells us who God has mercy on and tells us who, he, who he'll harden. So we can go there. If Let me... Um, all right. Uh, so... All right. So since you advanced the conversation, let me just go to Romans 11. Yeah. And then I, and then we'll, we'll go there. So Romans 11 shows us uh, if we go to verses uh, 19 and, and 20, then you will say branches was broken off so that I may be grafted. And this is true that they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud. For if it's for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spill, spare, spare you. Know that the kindness and the severity of God's severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. So mm. where does who does God show his kindness to? To the people that continue in his kindness. And then if we go all the way down, uh, if we go to verses, uh, if we go to verses 31, or give me a second, if we go down to verses 30 to 33. For just as at one time you were disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you that they also may not receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Um, mm -hmm. So we see from 30 to 32 with the Israelites who were uh, cut off and now the Gentiles are grafted in that he now has mercy with uh, to all. So just two chapters after Romans, uh, Romans chapter 9, which you mentioned, Romans chapter 11, which is in context with Romans chapter 9, tells us who he has mercy on. So that would be my response. It's not some mystery. The people that get shown mercy... But I would mercy push back... Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, there's a little bit of that delay where I, I would push back, though, is that it's not mercy to all because even in chapter 11, it says that he's cut off branches. And that's back in Romans 9. He will harden whom he will harden. He will prepare those for destruction. Yeah, but brother. And so Romans 11 is painting that picture of, of what we see in the Old Testament as God's covenant people. And we're saying in the New Covenant, it's both Jew and Gentile who is the yeah, true but... God, which is another topic. But th because we have the law of God written on our heart and the spirit residing in us, we will not depart from him. Where in the old not to cut you, you off, not, not to cut you off, yeah. because I know that there's a delay. And I would agree with you if verse 23 wasn't there, because it says, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted mm -hmm. in, for God has the power to graft them in again. So even right. in, in verse 23, even Romans chapter 11, verse 23 suggests that those natural branches who were the Jews who were cut off, even they can be shown mercy if they don't mm -hmm. continue in unbelief. So my argument is this. My argument is God shows mercy to whoever goes and continues in belief. All you have to do is believe. To everybody watching, all you have to do is believe. And contingent you have belief, provided you continue in his kindness, you will not be cut off and God will show you mercy. The text says if you don't continue in his kindness, you will be cut off and you will not be shown mercy. So Romans chapter 9 is not a mystery. I'll show mercy on whom I show mercy. Romans chapter 11 lets us know who he shows mercy to. And if you don't continue in his kindness, you'll be cut off. And if you do continue in his kindness, you will be shown mercy. Yeah, so we're <laughs> dipping into a little bit of perseverance of the saints in that regard, right? Um, I know, that's why I'm with trying continuing to. In the really kindness. Just, I know, uh, it's, it's difficult to do yeah, this. It's things. tough. But, it's, it's hard to not that's jump where, letters when you're talking about is. this topic. Can, it is. That, can, can, I, can, I, can I allow uh, Jeff to go ahead and respond because there's a lot said? If you you gentlemen will allow me to, to go to yeah. Romans 9, uh, and then I can touch on it the way I see it. it go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I just want to point out, like, look, you keep bringing up the text, Romans 10, 17. Right. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God, depending on your translation, the message of Christ. I think we would agree it's the gospel. Right. The gospel is God's power for salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. My question is this. Can a person just wake up and decide to to believe in Christ or does the gospel need to be preached in order for them to receive the faith? How I would put it. Faith comes by hearing. So when you hear the gospel, we're saying that's when you're gifted the gift of faith. That's when faith comes to you, right? Mm -hmm. God gives you faith to believe. Like we can go to Ezekiel and I can show you the order of salutis, right? Ho uh, regeneration, Holy Spirit, the removal of the heart of flesh. And, and, and I mean, the removal of the heart of stone, self righteousness, giving you the heart of flesh, faith. And then the same because because I would echo everything you're saying about faith, but but you're looking at it from one side. You're looking at it from man's responsibility. I believe that faith comes by hearing, hearing of the word of God. When someone hears the gospel, God gives to them faith to believe, or else they cannot believe that He entered into creation, so on and so forth. So so when you say that that God uh, faith comes by hearing, what are you saying? Uh, Jeff, so, yeah, uh, I did want to stick to Romans, and I, I am enjoying this conversation, fellas. I really am. This is very fun. Um, so I would say that in Romans chapter 10, when it says faith comes by hearing, I believe that when you preach the gospel, the gospel has the power to persuade the hearts of men to ultimately believe and have faith. So we agree there. It's just a matter of, I believe that regeneration comes after. So I believe that there is a choice that has to be made. And I think that the order of operations is hearing the gospel, obviously. And then after hearing, you have to make that decision. Hence the text that you mentioned earlier, which we disagreed on, which is whom, choose whom you will serve. Uh, and all the texts that suggest that you have to make that decision. So faith comes by hearing. Obviously, we preach the gospel. The gospel has the power to regenerate. And we all agree with that. But you have to make that decision. And I don't think God will force that decision on you. And so that's that. Right, let me now, jump in here on the, on the Romans 9. Let me jump in here yeah. on the Romans 9. Because we're mm -hmm. getting too far. So you read from 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy. 
and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. Well, that's direct response to what I believe is an objection by the Jews in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Well, the Jews would be making that objection. Why? Because verse 1 through 13, Paul walks them through that the gospel, the spoils, the inheritance is now given to the Gentiles. So they're saying, well, this is unrighteous. God gives gives them the, the inheritance. That's not correct. So 15 is saying God can do that. If he wants to do that, he can. You slide down to verse 20, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Well, the thing formed, say, to formed it. Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay to make uh, from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Well, this is Paul, the same author who authored uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I believe this explains it. Uh, couple that with Jeremiah chapter 18, and we have the same uh, message. The message is that if a believer or a person obeys, right, and in this case it would be talking to Israel, right, and, and he likened Israel to who? To Pharaoh, right? Then he will mold you into a vessel of mercy. But if you don't choose to do that, just like Second Timothy references, then he'll make you a vessel of dishonor. And we know that from the beginning of time, according to creation, there are those that will believe, sons of God, and those that won't, sons of Satan. Those that will be called vessels of mercy, and then those that will be called vessels of destruction, or those that are uh, made before him for destruction. So in the context of Romans 9, he's simply telling the Jews, this mercy has now been given to the Gentiles. Don't be like Pharaoh who I made an example, I could have killed him, but I kept him alive to show my message that ironically went out to all these Gentiles that you're now complaining have the spoils as well. So it's it's just giving them uh, a full view of God's judgment, um, uh, mercy, and of course salvation that's brought to now the Gentiles. That's what I believe Romans 9 is saying in context. Yeah, I, I appreciate what you just said there, Maller. So I, I agree with well, a lot of what you just said. I don't agree obviously with your conclusion. And I also don't agree that that Romans nine is only talking about the Gentiles. And I'm not saying that necessarily. You're saying that, but the the gospel going out into the Gentiles. What the issue that the many Jews and a lot of the books of Paul that he's writing is actually telling the Jew, the Gentiles are a part of the covenant people. Stop treating them like they're not a part of the covenant people. They're part of the new covenant people. And that's why in Romans nine it says not all of Israel is descended from Israel. Not all of Israel is Israel. And so it, not all of the people that are physically descendant of Abraham are part of the new covenant is what Paul is trying to argue in this text, I would argue say. And so then further on in that text, so that includes both Jew and Gentile, we see what Israel deserves and what or Israel receives, which is vessels created for mercy. And so in Romans 11, as JP already said, and, and when we read through that text, those natural branches, the natural seed of Abraham was cut off upon who, whom God would have favor towards. And now it's all those that would have faith in Christ, Galatians 3, right? That uh, we are made the, the descendants of Abraham, inheritors of the prophets through faith in Christ, the seed. And so, yeah, when we go to 2 Timothy and we see him talking about these things, it's in light of Jews not treating Gentiles like they're actually covenant members. And that's what I think Paul's addressing in Romans 9, that before the foundation of the—I'm inserting words in this text— but, but before the foundation of the world, before you did anything, before even Jacob and Esau did anything, I already had a purpose. Before, before uh, any action was ever done— I had, I had declared uh, that um, I was going to create these individuals, create these vessels for mercy. And that what is what I think the objection is getting at in this text is saying, Jew, how dare you even question me as your creator because I am so much greater than you. You cannot. And I think, it, I think Romans 11, I'm going to just read this last. I know I'm going on for a, lot, a long time, but I think, JP, you stopped a little early in, in when you were reading Romans 11, because I think Romans 11 actually ends with the logical conclusion of what Romans 9 was teaching. Uh, verse 33 and on, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways, meaning it should make us shut our mouths. We, sh we can't comprehend God. For who has known the mind of the Lord who has become his counselor? Who, who has first given to him that it might be repaid to him? I, I, I think, again, that's saying, is there anything I can do that will earn favor before God? No, it's him that first gives to us, and then he receives. 
for through well, him or that. for from him, yeah, me, through him and to him are all things for him to be the glory. Yeah, yeah, let me respond. All right, so J- JP, go ahead, respond. And then uh, mm-hmm. I think we said Braden mm-hmm. and Jeffrey have the last response in this round. And then we'll conclude uh, yeah, our conditional uh, lecture. Yeah, uh, if you don't mind, because uh, let can can you allow me to respond to Romans 11 and allow Marla to respond to Romans 9? And then you can let them have the last word, Marla. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, so verse 34 and 35 and 36, we all agree that in Romans 11, right, in 34, 35, 36, yeah, who can comprehend the (laughs) will of God in all these things, right? Who can fully understand God? I don't fully understand God. I don't even know why I'm here. But that doesn't dismiss the previous verses. And the previous verse is saying that even those who were cut off can be grafted back in contingent that they believe again so anybody can believe cut off or not cut off everybody has the opportunity but ultimately if you choose to remain cut off god will use you as a vessel of destruction and so romans 11 is very clear who who he'll have mercy on and who he won't have mercy on because romans 9 makes it a bit of a mystery but romans 11 reveals that that's just my stance and i don't think 34 35 or 36 refutes me I agree. It's a mystery. Or why am I here? The power of the, you know, the authority of every, all that stuff. It's a mystery. But it's, it's Romans 11 gives us the formula. Go ahead uh, for Romans 9. Go ahead, Muller, and we'll let these gentlemen have the last word. Uh, yeah. So just to finish off, so we do agree. The first 13 verses, we disagree. So the first 13 verses of Romans 9 is Paul telling the Jews, I got news for you. Not everybody who was born of Abraham is a Jew. Then he's focused on what verse 5 says, the Christ, right? So in verse 5, he's explaining how it came about. And he's showing even the most unorthodox ways of uh, Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau, how the elder will serve the younger. That's all unorthodox. He's trying to make a statement to them. Then you get to verse 3, 13, where he says, uh, reminds them of the promise, Malachi chapter 1 where he quotes Malachi 1, which is they were doubting the promise as well. So he's trying to tell them, listen, this is how it's all coming about. You're doubting the promise. I can see it. And he references Malachi 1, which is where uh, uh, Jehovah the Lord is telling uh, Israel, you you say, uh, "How um, how have you loved us? And he makes that statement. So I think it's perfectly, you have to, you have to, uh, parse um, Romans chapter 9 in the first 13 verses, but you really have to focus on the three objections from the Jews that I believe are coming from the Jews. Verse 6, verse 14, and verse 19. If you focus on those, you're going to see that he deals with those objections and tells them these these are, these are gifts, th- this inheritance is now offered to uh, the Gentiles and they're objecting. So if you follow the arguments, then at the end you're going to see this, uh, when he finishes Romans chapter 9 in the latter verses, that's why he can get to 24 and just give him the prophet, uh, the prophecy of Hosea, which pretty much just seals the deal. That now these vessels of, of mercy are coming about, but I believe that is in reference to their obedience, just like 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20 and Jeremiah 18 state. It's just consistent with the Bible throughout. But I yield. Yeah, so I, I'll let Jeff uh, finish last here real fast, but I do agree with what JP said that we can't let a, a later text undo a previous text. And I think the previous text says in, in Romans eight twenty nine, which we didn't talk about, but I'm, I'm sure we'll get to at some point. But those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to uh, the image of the Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, Those people are called God's elect in verse 33. We then see that that's why in Romans 9, it continues to talk about how uh, the elect are the true, uh, I'll I'll insert the the word for our understanding, the true Israel of God, the true covenantal people of God. And since that covenant was instituted at the death of Christ, all those things before that were covenant of work. So God's covenant people, People in the Old Testament were covenant of works that were taking place in there. And so even JP said earlier, uh, and I, I, I think we caught this, I think I hope everybody heard this, but JP said um, that the Jews, the Pharisees, did not ever believe in Christ. And then in the last little bit, he just said that they can believe again. 
I, my argument is, is that those Pharisees, those Jews that rejected Christ, the physical descendant of Christ, uh, were never a part of the true Israel. They were God's covenant people and works, but they never believed in Christ. And so how are they? Marlon, really come on, bro. That was a branch? shot, Marlon. That was a <laughs> shot. <laughs> Sorry. That was a little bit of a shot, that, JP. But... <laughs> that was a shot. <laughs> so that, that shot. is how they will be reinstituted, is having faith again, but by having faith in the first place, which is still dependent upon being predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Yeah, I would just uh, that add to it. That was a shot at G, a little bit of an inconsistency. No, no, no. I got to clarify that, though. I got to clarify that. Marlon, can yeah, I clarify so, so. before the pastor goes? Yeah, go ahead, bro. Nah, but I we, thought they were finishing nah, we, up. We, we, we got to transition, man. Hold on, bro. Yeah. You can't allow somebody to put words in my mouth and then not let me clarify, brother Marlon. Quickly, Come on, y'all. We're going to be stuck on this subject forever. I know, bro. We're, right. already, we're already an hour late, bro. We okay, got three okay, we just wrap those up at one. Go I ahead. agree there are people that never believed, and you can't be grafted back if you never believed. So I agree with that. So I'm talking in context of people that did believe. If the Pharisees never believed, 100% I'm with you. Go ahead, Pastor. <clears throat> yeah, so there's no way that we can press each other as much as we want to on each verse since we're – we're taking the totality of tulip and we're trying to to, to, to answer each mm -hmm. point. But just real quick on something that was mentioned earlier and Braden was kind of touching on it. You know, we're we're looking at this from two different covenants. And, and in the first covenant, you have the, uh, the physical descendants of Abraham. And then in the new covenant, it's the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Although in the first covenant, you can be a, a physical descendant of Abraham and, and also a spiritual descendant of Abraham. But if you're like me, a Gentile, you can only be a spiritual descendant of Abraham. And so, and so when we're talking about election, like there's, you have to look at it from two, two, two from from two sides because God chose a physical descendant, a descendants of Abraham to bring about the Christ, but the overarching covenant that I spoke about in the beginning, the covenant of redemption, this is all about the spiritual descendants of Abraham that God chose to save a people, and in time He sends His Son to accomplish the purpose and that has to his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and that you and I are a part of this great work through the preaching of the gospel. We go out and we preach the gospel, which is the message of Christ. That was his purpose. And the whole and, and we depend upon the Holy Spirit to save those who hear the message. As they hear the message, God grants to them faith to believe. Thank you. Marlon, I you're muted, Marlon. You're muted. I said all that good stuff. I ain't gonna repeat all that good stuff no more, man. <laughs> nah, I'm just playing. Nah, Bro, nah. We're, we're, we're enjoying we the conversation, man. We got three letters left and we got one hour left. So how are we gonna that, do That's this, what I'm bro? saying. I don't know how we're gonna do it, bro. I don't know how we're gonna do it. You, you know what I'm saying? So, well, keep it hold on, hold on. <laughs> Limited atonement, right? Limited atonement, it, irresistible it, grace, impressive grace. events. Bro, let's just go in. To, let's go into the linchpin. We know what it is. It's perseverance of the saints. If that's not true, then all this falls apart. No, we're just spend more doing that, bro. I mean, I'm just telling you, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be crawling I around this idea that if on that is not true. <clears throat> What's that? On regeneration? I think it stands well, or falls can, maybe, on regeneration. Maybe we could just slice the time to 15 minutes a letter. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's I, let's get I into would, it. Then. I would rather not, just because we agreed on the 30 minutes. So if we want to do it again. In the the future yeah. and we want to stick on one topic so you want to just go whatever letters and then we can just do a second one on the remaining minutes. letters yeah so you uh, we yeah, that's what we can, this what we can do mm, we'll, so we we'll, can do another we'll, live stream we'll, on the remaining letters yeah we'll keep the how about this? No, I thought, I thought we were going to finish oh. up on how about this we can do the next two letters and then we could do a live stream dedicated to perseverance of the saints how does that work hmm that'll work Get you mm -hmm. in an hour. We leave the P. That would be OSAS. Come on, come on. You can always have a good OSAS debate, Marlon. That'll, that'll right, bring the people. Well, let me think about it. Let me think about it here. Let me think. I mean, Marlon. <laughs> I don't we know. Have... Well, we'll see. We'll see what that. Well, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Let's get through. Let's see if we. Let's see what we can get through here. Let's get to two. Then... Mm -hmm. Marlon, stop least... us at the thirty. 
Yeah. yeah. That's that's the key right I there. Mean, that's even the if key. That's the case. We we have two. No, we're still ninety so. minutes out. So we gotta get two in. We gotta get two in. And then uh and then we can leave the, the P or uh for for another stream. I, I mean if that's what you you all wanna do. That's what I think. Unless you almost gonna, the time. I'm doing a hard Jeff, I'm doing Jeff, a hard in an Jeff hour. And Braden, are you guys are you guys open to that? Are you guys open to just addressing the last two? These the uh, limited time and irresistible grace, and then doing perseverance of the saints, and we'll make that one big show. I, I think if you do limited atonement and then go to perseverance of the saints, that in the perseverance of the saints, we'll be able to draw from the eye. Like if you allow us to draw okay. from the eye as well, we can get it all done. Oh, so okay. Let's like, fire away. Yeah, that sounds that sounds reasonable. What you think, Brady? I like that. Yeah, I that like sounds that. good. All right. All right. Cool. All right. All right, so we're going to limited atonement. Let me define limited atonement real quick, and then we'll jump into it. All right, so limited atonement is Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secure salvation for them. His death was a substitute, substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in a place of certain specific sinners. In addition to putting away the sins of his people, Christ's redemption secured everything necessary for their salvation, including faith, which united them to him. The gift of faith is infallibly applied by the spirit to all whom Christ died, thereby guaranteeing their salvation salvation all right so jp and mauler what are your thoughts on limited atonement all right ahead, so JP. i just uh just to speed this up a little bit i believe christ died for everybody and uh, i don't believe that means universalism as some of the people are saying in the chat that i'm a universalist i reject that in the name of jesus but uh, i believe that we all have the ability to receive the gift many argue that john calvin didn't believe in limited atonement in the way the calvinists do today mm -hmm. But I'm no expert. These two Calvinists are, so maybe they can explain how Calvin saw limited atonement. I would leave it with one verse just because, you know, I have several, but we don't have time. Uh, First Timothy chapter four, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the savior of all people, all people. And then it makes a distinction, especially of all those who believe. So there's the distinction of those who, you know, all people, all humanity. And then it says, especially, in addition to that, especially all those who believe. So I think it's very clear. The Bible's very clear. He died for everybody. Anybody can receive the gift. And that's that's just my position. Go ahead, Moeller. Hold on, can we allow him uh, to I don't have give much... us the context to that verse? Bro, but yeah, it's your time. As you much context, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I have a few words to say on limited atonement because, like I said, I, I believe it's all they're all tied together, obviously. But if, if you know, if, if, if God elected those to be saved, then limited atonement naturally follows. If that's what you believe about election or predestination in terms of faith, so I don't much to say. This one, my biggest issue is I, I just. I reject it because of some of the verses that uh, um, that we all know are famous, and of course the one that JP brings uh, is bringing up as well. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to me that God doesn't want anybody to perish, but that all may come to repentance. So um, that's that's where I feel the disconnect on limited atonement. But it's not something I've studied a lot because I just think it's a it's a natural process or uh, logic that follows after. You know, uh, unconditional election. That's that I see where you get there, but we have to presuppose all those other letters before I uh, am able to accept this. So I reject it just based on that premise. But I don't have much to say on it. You gentlemen could take it. I will say this, Mueller, and we'll let them go. If there are people that are truly saved because they were, you know, God died for them, limited atonement, why does the scripture say that they can turn away? And so lose their salvation. Bingo. That's why I told you Osas perseverance. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm finished. Go ahead, fellas. Jeff, I'll let I'm you finished. take this one first. How about that? Well, I mean, like, there's no way to answer. I mean, because they brought up some verses and they didn't explain the context. And, and every verse that they brought up, I can give the context to show that it's not meaning what they say, whether it's the first Timothy or the, uh, the, the Peter passage, the, the second Peter passage. But but I'm going to respond positively to why I believe it. And then hopefully we're allowed to give the context of what they expressed. 
right? So in, in Colossians chapter two, I think verse 14 seals the deal. It says, have, uh, so it says, having counseled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he also has taken it out of the way and having nailed it to the cross. And so it speaks about that we have a record of debt, right? A debt that we cannot pay. We broke God's law. God has paid our fine by sending his son, Jesus Christ. Again, the gospel, to live the life we could not live, so on and so forth. All right, so this is the idea that as, they were, as the Roman soldiers were nailing Jesus to the cross, this is telling us they also nailed a record of debt that stood against us. And we all know that Christ comes down from the cross. My argument for limited atonement is that that record of debt has not come down. And so, and so you can either say that he died for everyone. And if you say that he died for everyone, this is saying that, that, that no one has a record of debt. So that is universalism. If he dies for some, which would be the elect, then those whom he died for do not have a record of debt. If you, or if you say that he died for everyone, the, the, the other argument would be that no, he actually didn't die for anyone. He just died and, and, and this record of debt, it, it doesn't even exist. Nothing was nailed to the cross. But if there was a record of debt, that means that record of debt was paid for. If it was paid for, then those who are in, I mean, if it was paid for, those whom it was paid for are not going to be charged with that record. And uh, I'll, I'll let Braden pick up right there because I know we share the same idea, but but just because we only have a limited time to talk, I'll let him speak up for that. Brother, you're not talking yeah. like there's a limited time to talk. You're preaching sermons out here. <laughs> You got Listen, if it was to do a time test, if it was to do a time test, I guarantee you y'all are speaking more than us. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You're a pastor, man. Brother, I'm never having a, okay. a pastor again. I learned my lesson. Go ahead, bro. <laughs> so I, I, I would pick off for, up from where Jeff left off. I think uh, Colossians 2.14 text is, is beautiful, um, that that record of debt was paid there fully on the cross. Um, and that's why Jesus says that word to Telestai. That's a, a, a finishing payment word uh, that all was done and it was all completed. Um, I would look at an analogy to help explain limited atonement that actually comes from somebody who I've sat under uh, Matt Slick on this, uh, but he refers to it as the coma man. If, if a man is in a coma and I go into the hospital and I see it and I, I, I and this analogy only goes so far, but if I want to have mercy on him, I pay his full wage of debt. He's racked up a million plus dollars there in the hospital. I pay it fully for him. I walk out. He then wakes up. Um, that debt is removed when he woke up. That debt was removed before he woke up. That debt he cannot pay anymore. Even if he said, I, I don't want that payment. Uh, I, I want to pay it myself. It would actually be illegal. It would be unjust for the hospital to charge him more because they already took the money and accepted the payment. And so in that analogy, if there were multiple people in the coma, if I paid for all of their debt, I paid for all their sin in this analogy, how is it that somebody can wake up and still have that debt held against them? And that's where limited atonement comes in, is that, that it's not limiting the power of the atonement, but it's limiting its scope to those who mercy on, those vessels of mercy, which is unconditional election. I think when we look at the, the text, and I don't want to go too long, but I think when we look at those texts that, that JP brought up and, and, and I think Mahler even made mention of, I think when we look at those things, it's not necessarily a descriptive of God's salvation, but more or less uh, prescriptive in saying uh, the context is, is, again, those Jews were looking at themselves as the real covenant people, and they were looking down on brothers, uh, 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 Gentile believers, and so that context would show that that um, it's it's again it's it's all types, all kinds of people, and especially those are the believers. Those are the 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 the, the true Israel of God. What we would see from Romans nine, and I, I would also, in short, appeal to the. Oh the, come the, the, on, the, I know I would appeal that we should go to the text that is explicitly talking about salvation to build a doctrine on salvation, rather than going to the ones that are being pulled. At, when it's not talking specifically about salvation in those texts. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, fellas, I will responsible for these guys 
in one minute or less. Check it out. All right, so look, real quick, real brief. Look, I even started the clock. I'll respond by saying that with limited atonement, and I believe that you guys are strong me, strong manning us, not because you want to or anything like that, but it's just because we don't believe that because you're available to receive the gift that supports universalism. That's number one. And number two, I would argue and say that the gift is available to all, not just all kinds of men. The text doesn't say all kinds of men. The text says that anybody and everybody uh, can receive the gift. And yes, we all have a, an enormous amount of debt. We all have sin. We all have these things. We cannot pay it. But this is why Jesus made himself available to all men, because with, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he cancels that debt. So to respond to the brother on top, just because you can receive the gift, it doesn't mean that that supports universalism. And to the brother in the bottom, I reject the fact that you say that, um, you know, in regard to uh, what was it that you said? You said uh, all kinds of men. I would have to say that the text is very clear. It's talking about the people that received them and the people that did, that it did not. All right. A minute and 18 seconds. Marlon, you got to get on top of this, bro. These guys are pastors, bro. Could someone? I'll just say, the, the just say this real quick. Let me just say this real quick. Let me just say this real quick. Just in terms where I'm a little nervous in terms of Colossians chapter two is the way you, you folks are just looking looking at a, a metaphor of nailing it to the cross and taking that um, you know fully through to your doctrine and, and literally nailing it to your doctrine, no pun intended. That that's just my only issue because you have verse fifteen and having disarmed the powers and authorities, you made a public spectacle of them, triumph uh, triumphing over them by the cross now that didn't happen literally so some of these things that he's using is, is metaphorical language and i don't have an issue it with did, it actually. but it still doesn't prove it still doesn't prove uh limited atonement so uh, i would just reject that go ahead i i would say well, it, it, the text. Text. it happened literally yeah, it did happen literally. It's like when you try to swing a punch at somebody and it comes back and hits you in the mouth. Wait a minute. You're, you're saying that Christ the was cross. up there? And, and, yeah, but Christ was up there nailing sins? So he was taking sins and nailing no, 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 it to no, the no, cross? No, no. All right, the then Roman that's what I mean. Soldiers, no, no, the Roman soldiers, as they were nailing him to the cross, this is telling Correct. us they were actually so, also nailing a record of debt that stood against us. Okay, but they okay, but were were they actually? Um, you're, you're proving my point. So we have to examine that in light of the metaphor that he's using. And I'm just saying it's it's not it's not strong enough in my opinion to prove limited atonement. I understand what you folks are saying, but if I did that, a lot of scriptures I could really massage them to a doctrine that I don't think by using metaphorical language you can do that. I I simply can't. But. All, right. I, I hear all, all we're saying. asking is to deal with the text. If, if you give us a text and say deal with it. Me and him can deal with it, and I'm saying that y'all are not dealing. What do you? With what do you mean? I we're deal. I'm dealing with the text. I utterly reject the idea that nailing it to the cross proves proves limited atonement. Rejecting I don't it see it. I don't think you. Okay, so I'm saying nailing it to the cross is that literal? Did yeah. he take sins and literally nail the sins to the cross? The record yeah. of death. Or do you have to explain that? Do you have to explain the, the record of death? Of death. Okay, so then We're there's dead. So the Roman soldiers nailed it to the cross. Are, oh, that's that's what I'm asking you. So then this metaphor requires explanation, and I'm simply saying is that's what I'm seeing in this text here. You folks keep saying he literally nailed sins or those sins to the cross. You know that's not the case. So then we have to flush it out and explain it. This is not a text that I would go to to prove limited atonement. I understand that you, you don't believe, believe in that if the debt is nailed though. to the cross. I'm sorry? You don't believe in it, so you wouldn't go to any text to prove that, limited atonement. Yeah, yeah. There's, I believe there's better text to go to to prove limited atonement and, and let's say, attacking the idea of all because we can we can concede that all's used in different terms. I would go there. But that's just, again, that's just me. I'm just saying is this, to me, the language, you're going to tell me it didn't literally mean nailing it to the cross in regards to sin. What you're saying is that because Jesus was nailed to the cross, therefore the debt was paid for and it was nailed with him. Metaphorically, you're saying that. I don't believe it's literal. 
And that's all I'm saying. I, I, I think it's as literal as what the text allows it. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, when he was on the Christ, cross, when Christ got, was nailed to the cross, he was imputed mm -hmm. with all the believer's sin and it was paid there fully. That certificate of debt that was hostile and contrary to me was right. nailed there. I, I'm curious, what would you say verse 14 means? But you're, you're, you're saying is that nailing it to the cross, which is Jesus, right? Okay, agreed, got it. But you're saying is that because it was because it was nailed to the cross, this proves limited atonement. This is your text. You came to this text yeah. to to show me that. So how is yeah, nailing those, it to the cross prove limited atonement? It, it's a record of debt, right? Like this is a propitiation. Mm -hmm. It's an appeasement. Like like we can get into First John chapter two, verse mm -hmm. two, right? And so, I agree with and so that. this record of debt was paid for. Uh, Christ appeased. He, he is the payment for our wrongdoing. And so whoever this right. record of debt is for, these sins, mm -hmm. they don't have a record of debt anymore. And so if you're saying that it, he died for everyone, then everyone's sin mm -hmm. is paid for. Therefore, when they die and they are cast into, the he cast into hell for not receiving Christ, it's... It, 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 they're getting punished the, the sin that debt is being paid for twice hence the uh the analogy that Braden gave no, and we're just asking y'all to yeah, deal but with I, I reject we'll that because deal the verse any text you give us yeah i know but you're not dealing with it because it says in verse 13 god made you alive with christ he forgave us all our sins so he's mm -hmm. saying yeah. and, and paul is saying in this in in this particular verse he's talking to christians so i don't have yeah, a problem in the he's still of making a statement Agreed. But brother, what you're not understanding is you go to nailing to the cross and you're telling me that that is an argument that's a defeater or an argument for limited atonement, therefore defeats that Christ died for all. I do not see it because it says that he's speaking to believers. So anybody who will believe in him, that is going to be nailed to the cross or is covered already. Mm -hmm. Whether you receive it or not is when that is imputed to you. That's, mm -hmm. that's just simply the point. But I know you, you folks I already know this. I guess my press back mm -hmm. on you though is is if 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 the sin that was nailed to the cross, Christ being nailed there, mm -hmm. that propitiation that took place, mm -hmm. that is when our sin debt was canceled out, and that's what we're getting at. So, is an unbeliever if if you if if Christ died for their sins, when mm -hmm. was their sin canceled out? An unbeliever. It's not canceled out as an unbeliever. That's the point. That's why he says he forgave us. All our sins. So when Christ got off that cross, he didn't actually finish paying for unbeliever sins? Is those that will come to believe. It's simple as that. So he only he only canceled out the debt of sin for those that would believe. Uh, any any canceled debt that allows you into because you would agree that nobody can enter heaven unless their debt is canceled, correct? Yeah. Okay. There therefore we agree. Yeah. So, so for I you don't as a see believer, a Mahler, when when mm -hmm. was your canceled debt? When did it take place? I'm saved. So when I accepted Christ. So it it did not happen on the cross. Then is what you're saying. Okay. My my point is, if if debt was canceled to all those who believe, right? Then that's what yeah. has to take place. That's why I don't see. I don't have a problem when Paul, the very same, uh, the very same author, right? talks about the process of of uh, salvation that's why it is what well, by grace through faith the grace is there for you you need let faith to receive it no need but, but, no but need the, the to issue split hairs. let me hold on let me no ask this is where the hairs more. though do get split on this though well let me let me let me speak i haven't talked for almost yeah, an yeah. hour and you guys have been talking for years so let me speak where I say that you guys are splitting hairs is you guys are trying to get with technicalities. Our view is very simple. Anybody can receive the gift of salvation. Christ died for everybody. Contingent, you receive that gift. It's there for you. Mm. You can receive it. Now, if you don't receive it, if you don't receive the, the, if you don't receive the gift that Christ paid in the cross for you, which is, you know, dying, becoming sin for us, then it won't be activated. So either you accept it or you don't. If you don't accept it, that that's on you. 
So the, I think it's it's very simple. Either you accept it or you don't accept it. The technicalities the, of the, the, the same thing he says in Ephesians. Happen. Limited atonement, though, is not talking about when somebody accepts something, though. What we're talking about is propitiation. When Christ took the wrath from the Father on the cross, when it says in here, having canceled out the debt, uh, the certificate of debt, that was before anyone believed in Jesus Christ. That was before I believed in Jesus. Okay. And it's saying my sin, the believer me, before I believed, that sin was canceled there on the cross for me before I had the faith. Yeah. <clears throat> If it is, if it is a gift, it's a gift that must be received. So we are you telling me when somebody received. receives the, yeah. Okay. Then if you agree that it has to be received, then that means the gift is there. And upon we receiving it, that is you must when receive Christ. Okay. I understand that you receive it. I understand that you, you, you agree with receiving it. The issue is, is that Christ died for all, right? For all those who receive it receive that cancellation of debt why because the very same author says that you'd have to explain why the very same author is explaining a different process in ephesians chapter one he's talking right, about so, the the holy spirit guaranteeing uh placing a, a so, deposit for us to, to so this uh, is what i want the acquire people possession to, that are watching this is what i want the people that are watching to see so i want y'all to give us y'all's best verse that's that, that, that's opposite to this, and you're gonna see me and Braden walk through the text and explain it. And I want them to see that y'all did not. Do brother, that with brother, this text. brother, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. No, I, I want you to actually give walk me the, to text the text, and we'll explain it. Okay, we'll give you a bunch of text. That's not that's Please. that's not what we're gonna do here. So if you're telling me that we don't have the best text for limited atonement, you just brought to me. You brought us to Colossians chapter no, two to prove limited I'm atonement. Give me your best argument against it. Okay, text, I already we'll given you. I already giving you the best argument christ died for all so do you believe christ died for all or not give me a verse give me a okay verse so you don't believe through. christ died for all correct correct so now you want to get verses so we're going to do we're going to do this now okay well, I mean, I, we've been so i'll give you a bunch of them i'm, I'm going to see you walk through all of them okay. and when you do we're talking over each other we're talking let's try to keep it cool all right well, Mueller. No. well i mean nothing's getting done Okay, our, so uh, our Mueller, you say you're gonna give him some verses. Let's let's throw some verses out. Right, but are we are we moving? Are we moving on from a verse? But we can move on from limit for this to the other points because we're not gonna. Not, not yet we're not because we have. Time. Yeah, we have nine minutes left, and then we'll go. We're gonna combine. All right, First John chapter two. two First John chapter go. two verse two, and that that verse right there, you're gonna explain to me how that's not possible, and limit atonement refutes it. Go ahead. Right. Right. Hmm. Jeff, you want to go or you want me to go? Uh, I've been talking. If you want to take it, that's fine, but I, I don't mind doing yeah. it. So, so, um, I, I do just want to, I want to, I want to just quote, uh, uh, just a second ago on Colossians two, it was said, we're, we're getting, we're, we're looking at the technicalities of a text. So when we come to first John two verse one, let's look at it. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our only, ours only, but for those of the whole world. And by this we may know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God has been perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to love in the, uh, to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the world a word which you have heard on the other hand i'm writing a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining and i think that's talking covenantal the covenants but in verse 9 the one who says he is the light and yet hates his brother in the darkness until now the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for him to stumble now the reason i read all those texts together is that verse the verses preceding or preceding and after this is talking about loving our brothers. The, my argument from First John is that he's saying the 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 John is a Jew 
And so in the context of my little children, church members, my little children, okay, he's saying that there's some individuals in the church that are not actually loving their brothers, like we would see that is told to us to follow in verse 10. And so they are in darkness. They're, they're, it's saying that, that you're still in dark. If you, if you do this, you're actually breaking the violation. You're actually not, not, uh, not following the, wow. that which is the new covenant. And so what this is saying in verse 2, propitiation, again, we have to define propitiation, not for our sins only. Who is the owl in the hour in that? The Jews, but for the Jeez. whole world. Who are the ones, in, the ones that are the whole world in the following text? The Gentiles. It's talking about the whole world is both Jews and Gentiles in here. It's not talking about unlimited atonement or a, an atonement that is meant for all people. It's saying both Jews and Gentiles are a part of this propitiation. And again, well, how do we define propitiation? I'm going to go right back to Colossians 2.14. Right. So in John, go ahead. First John, it speaks about two sins, all right? One sin is hating their brother, which is the Jews not receiving the Gentiles. And the other sin is, is to deny in two ways that Jesus is the Christ. The Jews at this time were, den were denying that Jesus is the Christ. And then you had this guy by the name of Sorinthus who was teaching that, that, that the Christ came upon Jesus, but that the Christ did not come in the flesh right and so mm. the bible calls this antichrist and when you get to chapter five it talks about two sins one you should pray for and the other you should not you should pray for the jews who are not receiving their brothers in the faith you should not pray for those who are rejecting jesus christ and and, and so therefore they're antichrist and so like my brother Braden just said here when it talks about us it's speaking john is speaking to the jews and when he says the whole world He's speaking about the Gentiles. It's the same thing taking place in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. The Greek word there is cosmos. All right. They, if it would have said uh, oikomene, Jesus mm -hmm. would have never been crucified. Because if he would have said, for God so loved the Jews that he sent his only son, they would have received it. But because he said, for God so loved the world, cosmos, this is red, yellow, black, or white. All ethnicities. Mm -hmm. God so loves the world that he sent his son. All right. And, and if you break it down in the Greek, it's for the believing ones, but we won't go there. But just focusing on this text, the propitiation is a payment for wrongdoing. Like to give a, a short analogy, if my daughter breaks my neighbor's window and the window is one hundred dollars, she doesn't have a job. Daddy has to reach into his pocket and pay the payment. The money is the propitiation. It's the payment for her wrongdoing. Jesus, God paid our payment by sending his son. So he is the payment for our wrongdoing. And it's not just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles as well. All right. So they, they, okay, they explained well, they, they explain well, that text. So, so Mahler and JP, take as long yeah. as you need, because they did spend a, quite some time on that. So JP and Mahler, yeah, take I'll as just, long I'll, as you I'll need be, to I'll go be, ahead and uh, deal with that. I appreciate that. Because uh, we, yeah, we got 30 minutes left. All right. So um, first of all, what I didn't hear folks dealing with dealing with the text in context i'll just be honest with you you read the text and you asserted something about and the whole world being jews and the gentiles okay so gentiles. if if he's only right well but but again i don't i don't see that in the epistle the first epistle of john um i don't see him dividing that the way you are although even if you said the primary audience was jews I would argue, well, there was uh, teachers teaching things in churches, and we see that in, uh, in, chat, in verse uh, 219 and 20 and, and on. So you're going to have to argue that now he just wrote a letter to a church with only Jews in it, or primarily mm -hmm. and just focusing on them. But that's what I'm saying. Is, so I don't believe that he went First John uh, chapter 2, verse 2, and says, not only us, but that the whole world, and just forgot to say Gentiles. This would be he's 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 died for everyone, which is what something John has already said in his in his gospels. So it doesn't make sense to me that now he comes in here, wants to make a distinction that's not in the text, and you simply want to assert that because of the Greek word that that you you folks like to use and all. I don't I, I just I don't see it there. And considering John's the author, I, I just don't see him doing that. But that's just my point on it. Go ahead, JP. Yeah, and first, first Timothy chapter four, verse 10. Uh, again, 
I didn't see any. I didn't hear anybody refute. Again, they they, they asserted into the text. Brother, when you went in a soliloquy for almost 15, 20 minutes, did I interrupt you once, bro? I said we can. You said we didn't answer, but we can. We've focused on one text. Hold on. Well, bro, let me finish. I let you finish. I stood quiet. You and Brandon went in for a long time. Marlon didn't say anything. And not, let me just give me the same respect, brother. Thank you. All right. Well, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So that was not refuted either. So now let's get to the text and let's break this down. We're going to break it down. If you read the passage, the passage makes a distinction. The beginning of the passage says that he's the savior of all people, all people. Whether you read the Greek, Chinese, whatever the case may be, all people. How do we know this is talking about all people? Because then it makes a distinction and it says, especially of those who believe. Why would it say, especially of all those who believe? So the text is very clear here. And then obviously we have John 3, 16, for Christ died for the whole world, right? So, but if we're going to stay in 1 Timothy chapter 4, these guys went on on an essay of words and the text is very clear for what it says. I read it very slowly who is the savior of all people, all people, especially of all those who believe. I mean, the text is is very clear in what it's saying. So that's all I have to say. I'm going with what the text says. I don't have to explain it away, say, read the Greek, say this, go to 40 uh, different passages in the Bible. It's very clear, fellas. It's the savior of all people, especially all those who believe. If you reject the text and you deny the text, and you have to say that the text is saying something else or that the context makes the text say the opposite of what it's saying, that means you subscribe to systematic over the text. I'm reading what the text says. And I will go out and when I preach, I'm going to say these words. I'm going to say, he is the savior of all people. I'm going to say that when I'm preaching. And then I'm going to say, especially of all those who believe, that is a factual statement. He is the savior of all people, especially those who believe which is why we want people to accept the gospel in Jesus Christ. All right. So yeah. that will end that segment right there. All right. So now we're transitioning. We're going to combine irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints and see what we get. we got about 25 minutes left before Mr. Uh, Marler has to jet out. So let's get into it. Let's, uh, so it says, in addition to the outward general call to salvation, which is made to everyone who hears the gospel of the Holy Spirit, uh, extends to the elect a special inward call that in- inevitably brings them to salvation. The external call, which is made to all without distinction, can be and often is rejected, whereas the internal call, which is made only to the elect, cannot be rejected. It always results in conversion. By means of this special call, the Spirit irresistibly draws sinners to Christ. He is not limited in his work of applying salvation by man's will, nor is he dependent upon man's co- co- cooperation for success. The Spirit graciously calls the elect sinner to co- cooperate, to believe, to repent, to come freely and willingly to Christ. God's grace, therefore, is invincible. Uh, uh, yeah, invincible. It never fails to result in the salvation of those to whom uh, it is extended. And here is the definition of perseverance of the saints. All who were chosen by God, redeemed by Christ, and given faith by the Spirit are eternally saved. They are kept in faith by the power of Almighty God and thus persevere to the end. And so that is the definition of both of those. So, so um, uh, I think last time Mauler and JP started off. So uh, Jeffrey and Braden, what are your thoughts and continue that thought on that definition? I'll let Jeff start this time. Well, concerning irresistible grace, um, I just want to go real quick. Let me cut my timer on so I can keep up on how long I'm going. John chapter 6, and I just want to focus on one um, one area, and I know um, Braden might focus somewhere else. So John chapter 6, beginning in verse 37 into my Bible level. Okay, here we go. Verse 37. Okay, here he is. It says, All that the Father, Jesus speaking, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. So right here, 
just like what I've been saying, there's the two sides, right? Sovereignty versus man's responsibility. And in, in this verse, we see both of them, right? And our coming to Christ depends upon our being given to Christ by the Father. Like if you, if, if, if you look, you can see my door right here. So my door, I can't figure it out. Okay, so my door, the only way my door works is if it has hinges. My door is dependent upon the hinges for it to open and shut. So just take that as an analogy to understand that the only way that I can come to Christ is if I am given by the Father. And right here it says, speaking of those who are given by the Father to come to Christ, because we do come to Christ, it says, for I, uh, for I have not come down from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, this is the will of him who sent me that that all he that of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who sees the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. So right here in verse 40, it tells us how we come to Christ. It's by believing the Greek word pestuo, right? We have to believe. But our believing is contingent, of, contingent upon our being given to Christ by the father. Two minutes. Yeah, I'll try to try to keep mine around that same time. Um, so I think Jeff adequately talked about the drawing in John 6 to talk about irresistible grace. I would then push a little bit more with the perseverance of the great or the, the, the perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved, even Romans 8, 30 and those whom he predestined. He also called. That's what Jeff just went over with uh, the drawing and those whom he called. He also justified. That's the propitiation that we talked about in the limited atonement and those whom he justified. He also glorified. Um, I, I, and that's going to be the, the keeping us until the day uh, that he comes again. I think that's also predicated and seen in the last ending verses of Romans eight, where it says that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Um, I won't read that whole verse right now, but all of this is dependent on the understanding of Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, that we already looked at, that because Christ paid for our sin, not when I believed, but when he died on the cross, because he paid for it then, of course I'm going to receive that atonement, irresistible grace. He's going to draw me into a relationship with him. He's going to give me a new heart. And because my sin has been paid for, it's been canceled on the cross, I will persevere in his name. And that is uh, also seen in Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verse uh, 8 through 12 that was already mentioned. Uh, when we come into being drawn to uh, by the Father to the Son, we are given a new heart where the law of God is written therein and also on our mind. We know God. He knows us. Our sins are forgiven. Our iniquities are remembered no more. And that is why we walk in the statues of God uh, or persevere even in those ways is that we love God's law because the law of God is written on our heart rather externally. Um, all these things, perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved is dependent on upon the understanding of what Christ accomplished when he said to tell us die on the cross. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me respond to something real quick. Go ahead. Uh, you guys keep bringing up Colossians chapter two and you guys hop into 14 and you say that Christ paid for our sins before we accept the Christ. But in verse six, it says that as you received Christ Jesus as the Lord. So it begins the text by saying that we received Christ. Christ. And then it says that that's why our debt was canceled, not the other way around. So I think that's a quick one that you guys pulled. But because we don't have enough time to go through text and things of that sort, we're not able to, uh, you know, dig deep. But verse six makes it clear. They believe. Then their debt was canceled. Number two, let me go to a text of my own. James chapter five, since we're doing both letters. Mm. James chapter five makes it very, very clear. Give me one, give me one more. Uh, Pastor, can you mute your mic, man? There's a lot of uh, electricity going through. Thank you. All right, so give me one second here, fellas, as I pull up this text. I'm just loading up my Bible. Um, give me one second. James chapter 5. All right. Verse 19, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Here we have people that are brothers. They're in the truth. They need to be brought back 
it doesn't say they were never safe to begin with if they end up uh, if their soul ends up uh going in death so there you have that and then with the text with john mole is going to break those down being casted out is different from you walking away willfully james chapter 5 says that uh, if you wander away from the truth, me wandering away from something is different from me being casted out. All right, Mola, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll deal with the text in John chapter 6. So can pay attention to the text in John 6. Actually, we can start in 35. It said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Then 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So it's clear if you read this verse, 44, which would be the other one they couple it with, and then, of course, 45, that an order for you to be given to the Son... The Father gives to the Son, verse 36 solves that for you. These folks were not being given from the Father to the Son because they didn't believe. If you believe, you're given from the Father to the Son. It's pretty simple. And how do we know that? Because in 44, he's speaking to the Pharisees. How do we know he's speaking to the Pharisees? Because 41 says, the Jews then complained about him. That's the religious elite. Then he's speaking to the Jews now, a different audience, and he says something different. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then he tells you how it is that these that believe come to know about God and are drawn to the Son. 45. And it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So how do you come to Jesus? You have to be given from the Father to the Son. How? You're taught. You see the Messiah when he showed up on the scene. You said, that's him. You believe. The Father gives you to the Son. Easy as that. I yield. Yeah. Uh, so to answer, first of all, JP's text in James chapter 5, verse 19, uh, my brothers, if any among you stray from the truth and one turns him back, we have to remember, again, JP reading it in English, and I do agree with you, we should be able to understand these things in English. James 1.1, 1, 1, uh, or James 1, yeah, 1, uh, 1, 1, to the 12 tribes who are in the dispersions. These are Jewish converts who have come to be in the new covenant, and now they're turning back to go back to Jerusalem. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is trying to tell somebody not to do. That you're in Christ. Christ is the better. He's the fulfillment of all those things that the temple, the sacrifice, and the priests were pointing towards. And so in Hebrews, it says that if, if you turn back, that you're actually trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. That you're actually not really saying that you believed in the new covenant like you did. James chapter 5, 19 is talking about those that are turning back. And so it's saying, plead with your Jewish brothers to not go back to Jerusalem. Okay, wait a minute. And what, if, and what happens text. what happens what happens if they what happens if they do go back? If they do go back, it According means that they were James never a part of the new covenant. Yep, no, that means it's, that they did it, not they were not brothers. in the new covenant. They, no, it, it calls says, them brothers okay, well, and they were in the truth. Yeah. Because yeah, every so time that Peter truth, and Paul talk about somebody they always say on the side of grace. It, it no. says they were in the truth, therefore they need to be brought back. So what if they don't come back? So was James a Jewish person? Bro, Jewish. read the rest of the text. What happens if they don't come back? J James was an ethnic Jew. That's why he calls them my brothers. He says, my brothers, my my Jewish brothers don't Oh, they're turn not away they're not Christians. They the wow. He's know. saying the that if they, they are Christians, the they will stay. They, if they are Christians, no, no, no. it doesn't say that. It I, says that if they don't come back, their soul ends up in death. Again, we're looking at a text and its application. As a pastor, if somebody started to turn away from having faith in Christ, I would try to plead with them to not turn back. It says they're not, in the not truth, to though. turn away. Excuse me. What's that? It said James, but it said the text says they're in the truth. It doesn't say they weren't. And then it the says truth. not it to says turn from the truth and to turn yeah. him back. So, which means again, they were in it. 
when we look at other more clear lit texts that talk about like oh, no, this uh, is very John clear. chapter eight. No, yes, this it is. is. It is very clear. But yeah, it also it says, says if somebody's that, that, in the faith and they turn away from that faith, their soul will end up in death. And it says they were in the faith. They were in the truth. Therefore, they need to be brought back. But I'll let you finish. Go ahead. I don't think you responded yeah, yeah. to this accordingly. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. All I'm saying is that this is speaking in the context of what the whole book of Hebrews was written for, and that was to encourage the person, the Jewish person, that even though there's per, they're being persecuted and kicked out of Jerusalem, they are still in the better. They are in the new covenant. They are in Christ. And so that's what uh, James, Hebrews, which I'm saying is written by Luke, uh, by a sermon of Paul, they're always siding on the side of grace and saying, turn back, turn back, turn back. And that's that. I think that's a very biblical way to talk. It doesn't undo limited atonement. It doesn't undo perseverance of the saints. I would push All back right, so on John chapter six, though. Bro. I mm -hmm. think it's uh, just the logical conclusions from all the texts that we've looked at. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's also predicated on James chapter two. I, I would say that James chapter two, if they turn back from the blood of Christ, did they actually have a living faith or a dead faith? I, again, we know somebody based off their fruits, if they actually have a living faith, a living faith would say that they would stay there as a new covenant member. No, the uh, so they again, did have a living looking at the same text. Cousins. How do you know that they had a living faith? Because they were in the truth. Mm. When someone so comes to your church, church are they in the truth? Otherwise, otherwise the text when someone comes be, to your church, are they in the truth? Uh, they can they're among or the they truth, might not right? be. But if they're no, in no, the they're truth, they're in the they truth because they are in the right? midst of where the truth is being this taught. Text, this text is about people who are in the truth, not people who are possibly yeah. not or not in yeah. it. When the I have text an unbeliever come to your church, they're in the truth. Yeah, but do your uh, does no, your unbeliever? Uh, no, wait a minute. Is that unbeliever that comes to your church? You're telling me their soul is saved from death because there's a consequence no. to them no, coming back. Not. That's what ties them no, as a believer. Not. But they are partaking oh, right. in what's taking place in the new covenant. They are being. I know, partaken. but their soul is not saved from death, though. That's the Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. Not saying these particular people. No, but these particular people, their soul is being saved from death. Therefore, your argument would be if an unbeliever comes to your church, you're placing them in the category where their soul is saved from death. No, I didn't that, say that. That doesn't make, that doesn't make no. any sense. No, so we know it's a Christian because you're their soul is saved from death. What do you mean? Well, you, it, it, you, it's the same are... idea of what you was touching on in John, in, in, in John 6. You know, like, like if I can go mm -hmm. back to the original ones that I started with, the... Mm. It ends up with in verse 40, it says, and this will be, I mean, and this is the will of my father that everyone who sees the son and believes in him will have eternal life. Mm -hmm. You're saying that our believing is how uh, we're given to the son, but that's not what the text says. Absolutely. It says all that the father yeah, it gives does in 636. Me will come to Correct. me and our coming to him is believing, right? But in 636, I mean, I, it says they don't believe. Therefore, 637 says all that the Father gives me. That means you have to believe in order to be given all father that the to Father the gives six... him will believe. He's saying that they don't believe because they haven't been Ooh. given by the Father. Same thing takes place in John chapter 8. Okay, so, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. You just said something. You said all that the Father what? W come w gives me will all that believe. The father it doesn't say gives. that. Oh, no. It doesn't no, no, say no, no, that. No, no, doesn't no, no. say that. You yeah, just made that up. You said all that the Father me, gives me, will believe. No, that's your assertion. No, brother, you just asserted that. It's not in the text. Don't no, quote no, the text that way. I wouldn't do that. It's in no, verse 40. No, it's not in verse. Okay, yes, listen. You verse just quoted 40. 37. You quoted 37 this verse way. You said, all that the Father gives me will believe. It doesn't say that. It will come to me, and our coming to him is our believing. How do we come okay. to Christ? It's by believing. I argue that 36 says that those, they didn't believe. Now he's talking about the process of believing. So all that the Father gives me will come to me. Why? Because you can go to 44 and 45 to flush it out. So you and I disagree. But I'm saying is don't quote the text that all that the Father gives will believe because that's not what the text says. You're yeah. asserting that Mark, will come to me is the, the initiation of belief. Come to him. How did you come to Christ? Mm -hmm. Did you come to him by not believing or believing? Okay, well, first of all, the the process Jesus draws all men, John twelve thirty two. So we can talk about this People context. The this point is, themselves. you quoted the text this way. This is how you quoted it. All that the Father gives me will believe. It doesn't say that. If I said that, it I didn't mean to. That. If I said okay, that, okay, well, I didn't mean to. no, no problem. I thought it you says were all that the okay, Father gives me will come to Fair me, enough. 
and verse 40 tells you how we come to him and that is by believing so it does not okay. hurt to I get, I get the your word view. there and Mallory, right. you're I saying that believing you. comes before the drawing is that correct <laughs> What? Oh, no, in the you're talking about in the text you're in six thirty. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm asking. Are you me? saying? Are no? I'm asking. Well, are you, you saying? You that believe, in order to be drawn, when you, you believe, believe, the Father gives you to the Son. So that's yeah. I don't so have then, a problem why? With that. But again, this is why believing in in Christ, not believing in the idea that He's going around feeding people miracles. Remember, these okay. people witnessing all His miracles, they're being drawn, right? Okay. So, so there so is a form the, of, of assenting to something. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the Pharisees in John eight never actually had a real faith and therefore were never actually really drawn. And John, no, 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 I didn't say, uh, wait a okay, minute. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to put the right. All right. Conclusion. So yeah, uh, there's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of people drawn, but there's a specific group that we see that says the Jews in 41. So let's not go to John eight. Let's go stay here. John eight doesn't change anything. But you, you quoted Jews, from John 12 about God draws all people. And so I'm going to bring up to you. Yeah. Because God draws all people. John 8. If you didn't quote from faith. John eight, I wouldn't quote from John 12. No, I'm. I, so I don't need to. Go, I don't need to go to John. So I don't know. I just stay right here. Let's just stay here. Okay. So if we're going to stay right here, you brought up John here, 12 about God drawing everybody. I know because you brought up John eight. Did you not bring up John eight? I brought up John eight after you brought up John twelve. Oh, okay. So then I brought up John twelve in response to him saying to the Jeff. Father uh, yep. draws. Yeah, because the process. And you said he now draws all Christ people. Is. Correct. So how is it that God draws no, all no, people? No, no, brother. Now, after you know what John 12, 32 Christ. says, brother, John 12, 32 yeah. says that when he ascends, he'll draw all men to him. So yep. th there you go. So that's later. So you think that Tell the Pharisees, me about the process today. So you, so you think everybody has faith then? No, I don't think everybody has draws faith, all brother. You're, you're, okay, so let me ask you a question. When Jesus says, when I send to the Father and I'll draw all men, do you know what that means? Is that there at that point when he says it or later? Uh, so uh, it's it's in the future. It's later, it's brother. So me bringing yeah, up John twelve thirty two in reference to his process of God drawing. That's why I answered it that way. So I, believe I know, but something you, has changed. You just said mm -hmm. though, in order to be drawn, you have to have an actual faith in the actual Messiah and his actual accomplished work. So how is it in John twelve? And I in said a what? Sin, he says I, I draw. said what? Oh, hold on. What did you I said say? Something, I said something, and I hope I'm not misquoting you. You said something to the effect. Yeah, I think you are misquoting that in me. In order to be drawn, you have to have. I an never said that. Faith I, everybody is drawn minus one group. I'm going to say it one more time. Okay. Many people, all people, are drawn to God. The what question is drawn? whether these people right here, the Jews in verse 41. Read it. Look at your verse 41. Whether those were prophesied, prophesied as one that would be what? Blinded. Just like mm -hmm. John 12. Now I'm bringing John 12 says. So we have a group that are not being drawn, or at least this is what Jesus is telling them. Why? Because in 45, he says, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. So it's simple. Jesus comes on the scene. Those that were not just after him being drawn for the food and the miracles, they truly believe in him. They believe they're given from the Father to the Son. <clears throat> I really don't know where to take it from here. I don't feel like our questions are being answered. Oh, don't worry. He, misquote, he, mis he, misquoted, uh, he misquoted John 12. It's actually talking about when he is uh, lifted up on the cross not in his ascension. Um, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're saying John 12, 32, you don't believe when he is lifted up? You think yeah, that when, when he is when placed he is, on the cross? He, he, that's on the cross. Listen, listen, listen. It says, and mm -hmm. I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. But he was saying okay. this to indicate the kind of death in which he was about to die. So the lifting okay. up so is then him he's, being hung on the cross. Okay, so if he's lifted up and hung on the cross, you're telling me at that point he's drawing all men only in that point or in the future? That is the well, institution of the new covenant, that is the everlasting the covenant. Yeah, well, I would man. disagree. I would disagree. But, but you disagree with the yeah, we don't have ascension. Have you have been. Okay, what do you mean? It's uh, read, read the scripture again. Read the scripture again. Okay, verse 32. People can come to their own conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, verse 32. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all mm -hmm. men to myself but so it wasn't was from saying, the earth hold on, hold on let's it gives the commentary verse 33 
but he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was about to die. Mm. Okay. So then if he's lifted up, right? On the cross. Uh, on the cross, let's just say I go ahead and agree with you. He's going to draw all men unto him. So is it only in that moment that he's doing it? Only when he's lifted up on the cross, he's drawing all men? That's when it begins. That is the, ah, the, the, begins. the central point. Got that, it. So that's is the he drawing? Hold on, history. hold on, hold on. Hold on. Is he drawing men today? Yes Absolutely. or no? Absolutely. All right, then. By so we agree, regardless if you think. Okay, but regardless, if we agree on the lifted up, you think it's just up to the cross, and I think lift all the way up. I'm misquoting okay? like you told me earlier. Okay, that's not misquoting it. <laughs> that's your interpretation of it because I just all asked right. you. Does the draw right. only stop right when he's lifted up on the cross? You said no, it, it begins. That means it continues. Great, so you and I agree. We don't have an issue with that text. But the issue that <clears> I'm <throat> taking with this is that if, if you're saying – that even in James 5, there were people that had faith in Christ, their sins were paid mm -hmm. for, they had the, uh, the the righteousness of Christ covering them, they had the sin debt canceled years prior, right? If we're saying that they're turning away and losing those things, then John 6 verse 40 doesn't work. Uh, that, it means that they were drawn and they were not raised up on the last day. All right, Who so was drawn? Go, go ahead, go ahead. Believers are called. Yeah. So yeah, the contingency here is, right, as Romans 11, that you have to continue in the kindness, which is why I brought up Romans 11. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. Unless you're prepared to say the people that are cut off are going to make it to heaven anyways, that doesn't work. So you're saying John, John 6 doesn't work with James chapter 5. If your interpretation is correct, your interpretation doesn't work with James chapter 5. And it doesn't work with Romans 11 because Romans 11 says you can be cut off. And if you're cut off, you're not going to be saved unless you believe cut off people are saved. But contingent that you continue in the kindness, then you'll be saved. James chapter 5 is very clear. You can't get around this. It says, brothers, people that are in the faith, you have to be brought back to that faith. That saving faith that you were a part of, you need to be brought back to. And if you're not brought back to it, your soul ends up in death. So if I can I give think you a Romans verse where it clearly calls Jews brothers, where Paul clearly calls Jews brothers. Doesn't matter, bro. Whatever that, no, 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 whatever. No. If I can give you a verse in, where Paul clearly calls hold Jews on, hold brothers, on. would hold you on, brother. recite that interpretation? From the truth, wanders from the truth. That truth saved them. They were in it. Hence, why they have to be brought back. So, whether you say they're brothers or or transformers or aliens, whatever this was, they have to be brought back to it. Which Again, means that they though, were saved. Yeah. Which means they were saved because they have to be brought back to that particular thing. Otherwise, it would say you were never saved, so you have to come and be saved to begin with. It doesn't say that. The text is very clear. Romans eleven says that provided you continue in the kindness, or otherwise you'll be cut off. So I have James chapter five. I have Romans chapter eleven, and uh, John chapter uh, the John chapter that you're talking about. The contingency is you have to continue in the kindness, otherwise you'd be cut off. Mm. And I believe, mm. Moeller, that there's a text about the good fruit and the bad fruit. And if you don't bear good fruit, you'll be cut off. So it's mm. all over the Bible, yep. brothers. All right, all right. So what we're going to so, do yeah. is time. Oh, good. Because time has expired, and I know uh, Mauler and JP has to jet out. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to give each of you one minute, one minute to sort of close up your arguments, and then we'll uh, we'll end the show. All right. So start with JP and Mauler. Uh, you guys got one minute to uh, close Let up your arguments. First, bro. Yeah, I can go first. I'm going to peel away. Um, yeah, I appreciate it, brothers. Seriously, um, great conversation. I look forward to more. Um, I learned some stuff today, uh, but I also hope you could see my point of view. Uh, but I just say this, uh, in conversation, I think that, yeah, the text, how we deal with the text and how we approach the text is obviously uh, our own presuppositions on both sides. Nobody's going to deny that. The question is, what's more likely uh, when you take the totality of Scripture? And I just don't believe the system of tulip Calvinism best explains what's happening in the Scripture. Uh, I believe the passages that say choose, I believe the passages that say all, and I believe the passages uh, that say that we can walk away from Jesus. 
and therefore John, you know, James chapter 5, 19, all the book of Hebrews, all, all the book of Galatians, Second uh, Peter, the epistle of Second Peter, all would stand. If that's true, then I believe Calvinism uh, falls. So that's me. I yield. All right. All right. Uh, uh, I had fun. I had a great time. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming here and having these discussions. I think it's very, very important. Uh, obviously, you guys don't feel like we answered your questions, and I don't feel like you guys answered mine. But, hey, all in good sport. Obviously, it's not personal. I appreciate these conversations. I look forward to having more in the future. And uh, I have fun. This was a blast. You know what I'm saying? This was a blast. So I really do um Thank you guys for participating in this conversation. I really do. All right, Jeffrey and Brady. I'm going to check out. I'm gonna see you guys later. All right, brothers. We'll see you. Love see you, man. brothers. See you, I'm all Take care. care. See ya. Take care. You, don't Jeff, go first, you want me to go first or do you want to go? Yeah, I can go matter. first. Um, all right. Yeah, so I think I think I really appreciated what Mahler said earlier is that he can understand the plain reading of the text. And I think that that's one thing that we see that takes place within regeneration. In the garden, Adam had direct communication, <clears throat> direct communion uh, and relationship with God. And that is one of the curses of the fall is that they lost that ability to be in communion with them. And so when somebody is born again, they look at the word of God and they can now be in communion with God again. This is part of what Christ has done on the cross and uh, fitting together the whole body of Christ. And so again, I, I think that what we've shown is that in order for the atonement to make sense, it has to be in light of Christ. Uh, dying purposefully for his elect, I think. Um, I do appreciate JP. I do appreciate Mahler. I did learn things from them. It just hasn't convinced me out of what I'm seeing in the text. And that is uh, God has a covenant people and he enacted a better covenant. And that is the covenant of grace, which does save fully, surely, and will continue to save me until I uh, die and am glorified. Yeah, as I began, I want to thank uh, JP and Moeller as well. Thank you for participating in this. And I would love to do it again, except for next time, I would like for it to be a moderated debate to where we can yeah. have a longer time to speak and explain our position uh, concerning Romans 11. Uh, when it's talking about you can be cut off, this is speaking of the Gentiles, it's not speaking of individuals. And I would say uh, in Hebrews 2, uh, Jesus, it says that Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every way to be a faithful high priest. The brothers there are the Jews. And again, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 13 through 16, Jesus and the Father stand in unapproachable light. John 6, 44, no one can come to the Father unless they're drawn by, unless no one can come to Jesus unless they're drawn by the Father. In John 14, 6, no one can come to Jesus unless, I mean, no one can come to the Father unless they go through Jesus. And so, how do we get to God? Irresistible oh, grace man. chosen before the foundation of the world. All right. All right. Thank you guys so much. I know there's a lot left on the table and I'm sure you guys will deal with those things on your individual platforms. And so unfortunately we got to end it, man. We got to end it at some point, man. But uh, thank you guys so much for the time. Thank you so much for the discussion. Uh, and uh, obviously with these kind of discussions, it's always going to get, a, get, get a little spicy and, and that's expected, right? With positions that you're passionate about. So um, once again, appreciate you guys and I'm going to let you guys go and I'll be watching some of those uh, post debate shows. So don't you guys be in there eviscerating me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, put a comment on <laughs> Facebook and tag y'all in. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you guys are good, man. And I look forward to listening to some of you guys. Thank post. you, man. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you guys, thank you. it's all good, man. You guys are great. And I'll be looking, I'll, I'll be listening to some of the post comments, man. I am interested to see how you guys uh, deal with some of the issues that uh, did not get brought up. Wasn't able to get really handled. So I'm interested to see how you guys uh, deal with some of the issues that uh, did not get, wasn't able to get really handled uh, this time around. But guys, uh, you guys go ahead. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and I look forward to talking to you guys soon. All right, take care. God bless. All right, guys, another great show in the books. I hope that this was a good show for you guys. Uh, obviously, we tried to smash the full, all the doctrines of grace into one show, um, and that is a difficult task. Um, with any 
conglomerated theology like this, it's very difficult, but we did try to take it to task. And I think that we did a satisfactory job in that. Um, obviously we didn't get to deal with limited atonement. Uh, sorry. Um, Irresistible grace and uh, perseverance of saints individually, sort of combined together. But I do still think that it was one that was helpful. And so um, I am just thankful for you guys for coming on and taking time at the schedule to participate in this discussion. And I pray that you guys enjoyed it out in the audience. I hope that you guys will take part in further study in these areas of thought, and so that you could better not only be able to understand what you're discussing, but to better represent your opponent if you so get into a discussion concerning the doctrines of grace. And so, um, obviously, uh, everything, everything wasn't able to get discussed, but I hope that you guys would do your own post assessment of what was said and come to your conclusions based off what the information that's out there. Um, as you know, these shows are designed to sort of encourage you to further study, to go and investigate the claims that are made on the show. So you don't take the, the, the debaters word for it. It is to force you out there and to uh, engage with the content in a very, very, very uh, fair manner. All right. With that said, I'm going to get out of here and, and I'm going to get out of here and enjoy the rest of my evening so uh i pray i pray that you guys will take time to subscribe to the gospel truth and hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so to miss out on any shows if you have yet to do so make sure you hit that like button as well on your way out if you have yet to do so um support the ministry with subscribe follow and a like button at, at the very least all right all right guys i'm gonna take care uh, i'm gonna let you guys go you guys take care and god bless